Welcome, everyone. We'll ask you to start taking your seats. We're so happy that you're all here. I think the last two Tikkun Leil Shavuot programs we've had were on Zoom, actually, if I'm remembering correctly. So it's really nice to be together in person. So Shavuot commemorates the receiving of the Torah at Sinai, one of the origin moments for the Jewish people. If the Israelites gathered at Sinai, the first words that are spoken are, Anochi Adonai Elohecha, Asher Hotzeiticha, Me'eretz Mitzrayim, Mibet Avadim. I am your God who brought you out of Egypt, the house of bondage. And then only then could God deliver the Ten Commandments. First, we have to establish this foundation of our relationship. The foundation being that we were suffering and God freed us. Like throughout the Torah, we're told that because we were slaves in Egypt, we should know what it's like to be in need. And we should help others in similar situations. And the fact that we were saved from our biblical time of need, Egypt, is the very foundation of our mutual relationship with God, the, the covenant, the covenant that is entered into at Sinai that we celebrate on Shavuot. So I think that's why it's so appropriate that we are devoting or studying tonight to the situation in Ukraine. It's traditional to stay up late on Erev Shavuot to study Torah, and I can't imagine a better use of our time together than this. So we'll have lots of different ways throughout the evening to engage with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, hopefully by the end you'll be inspired to find your own way to do something to help, um, as we all know that's our way of honoring our covenant with God. So we're especially excited to have Joe Goldman here with us from HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Um, he is the Community Engagement Director for the Western Region. Um, and he is here to talk with us about what HIAS has been doing to help Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees, um, how you can get involved. Um, I know we're all really excited to hear from him. Later on in the evening, we're going to have other sessions with our rabbis and our, our cantors. Um, there will be Mar, even Havdalah. There will be cheesecake. Um, throughout the evening, I want you to know that there's a setup in Titus with cookies and water and tea and coffee and lemonade. So if you need a little caffeine or a little sugar boost, um, feel free to go and grab that. Um, so now I want to introduce Joe, who's going to come up and speak to us for our, our very first session um, titled Resettlement, Ruth and Ukraine, Our Obligation to Welcome the Stranger and Protect the Refugee. Thank you, Rabbi, and, and uh, good evening. Hag Sameach, Shavuot Tov, or almost Shavuot Tov. <laughs> and uh, how wonderful to be with all of you this evening, you know, for both the Temple Aliyah and Shomer Torah communities. It's, it's wonderful to have uh, both of your synagogue communities uh, working together for Shavuot. So the way this talk is going to work is we're going to First, go a little bit into kind of the intersections with Shavuot and this issue, um, and then I'm, I'll take a little more time to go into details on what exactly we're doing on behalf of uh, those who are fleeing Ukraine or forcibly displaced within it. Uh, and if we do have time, um, at, at the very end, I'm happy to take uh, a few questions, uh, but we'll, we'll, I, I know the, the rabbis here will keep me on, on time here. So the Book of Ruth tells the story of refugees. The first refugees we learn about are Naomi, Elimelech, and their sons who flee Bethlehem during a time of famine. Their need is so great that they go to the land of Moab, a historical enemy of the Israelites. The family is forced by circumstance to migrate to a place of uncertain welcome and perhaps even mortal danger. Upon arriving in Moab, Elimelech dies, but Naomi and her sons establish themselves and build lives there. But after the deaths of all the families she arrived with, and after learning that the conditions in which had caused them to leave Bethlehem had changed, Naomi decides to go back to her country of origin. In other words, she voluntarily repatriates once it is safe to do so. 
The United Nations has called voluntary repatriation the durable solution of choice for the largest number of refugees. Refugees in precarious situations in countries of first asylum often lack long-term integration or resettlement prospects and would like to go home when they can. But unfortunately, some governments attempt to return refugees and asylum seekers or send them to another country without the necessary conditions in place for successful reintegration. According to the UN, 251,000 refugees in 2020 were able to return to their country of origin out of a total of what was then 82.4 million displaced worldwide. International human rights law forbids countries from sending asylum seekers back to their countries of origin if doing so would place them in danger. And yet, just as one example of how these laws are violated in practice, our own government has used the excuse of COVID-19 to send Haitian migrants from the US-Mexico border back to Haiti, even though the government, our government itself, had recognized that political unrest and human rights abuses had made it impossible for Haitians to safely return to their country. So hearing just this little overview, I'd be curious, I have a few questions to ask you and I, I would love some you know, quick answers. How do you think Naomi's story would have been different if she had been forced to go back to Bethlehem before she was ready or before it was safe? That's a really good point. Really good point. Any others? Yep. Yep. You know, and how does it shift your understanding of the story in general? And we're, we're starting to get there. You know, uh, how does it shift your understanding of the story to think of Naomi, Elimelech, and their children as refugees at all? That also could just be a point. It doesn't have to be a question that we all answer. But yeah, go ahead. I'm really, really glad you said all that because that is one point of reference that I think we need to remind ourselves of just how desperate you must be when you are in this situation. And, and it's even in the, in the story of the Book of Ruth and, and so on, we see it right then and there. And, and yet we see it again, excuse me, I talk with my hands, what can I say? Um, you know, we, we see it again and again and again. So we know that you know, Naomi returns to Bethlehem with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and Ruth is not fleeing persecution, violence, or natural disaster, but she nevertheless finds herself in a place where she feels isolated and alone. She doesn't know the formal or informal community structures, has extremely limited access to resources, and is clearly understood to be a foreigner by those around her. She goes out to gather the grain that is left over in the fields after the harvest and encounters Boaz. Boaz offers Ruth protection, sustenance, and instructions on how to gather her own food. And later in the story, he offers her a pathway to permanence and place within the community. Boaz said to Ruth, you know, listen to me, daughter, don't go glean in another field. Don't go elsewhere, but stay here close to my children. Keep your eyes on the field where they are reaping and follow them. I have ordered the men not to molest you. And when you are thirsty, go to the jars and drink some of the water that they have drawn. Fast forward to today. When a refugee 
arrives in a new location, local resettlement agencies or private sponsorship circles provide services such as meeting the refugees at the airport, preparing their housing arrangements, helping refugees find English classes, medical care, social services, and registering for uh, their children for school. The US refugee admissions program model is built on the principle of self sufficient I swear I didn't plant her in the audience, but that was a great answer. Another person I did not plant in the audience, but that is actually a really, I think, great transition point. We, you know, I've just barely, barely, barely scratched the Book of Ruth here. I am, I am not a rabbi. Um, we have many other opportunities this evening to really dive deeper into the, into the intersections of, of the Book of Ruth and, and a lot of the holiday as to why we care. Bless you. Um, and and. Now I want to take us, you know, as we've barely scratched the surface with the book of Ruth and the intersections, I'm going to really, again, keep us in the present day and talk a lot about the work that Hyas is doing um, in Ukraine and, and other parts of the world. So this year, the world reached a horrific milestone. There are now 100 million forcibly displaced people that's far more refugees than what we witnessed after the Second World War. And that's 20 million more people than when I started working at HIAS three weeks ago this coming week. Sorry, three years ago, not three weeks ago, excuse me. Sounds like three weeks ago with that kind of mistake. But with that context, again, that's 20 million more people in three years. And it's a really important statistic. Thank you for sharing that. That is a really sobering thought. So with that in mind, I'm going to focus on the Ukraine situation because that is what is front of mind for us. And we need to keep this broader context that the global response to the Ukrainian refugee crisis is exactly how we must respond to other refugee crises. Yes, Ukraine is a huge deal because it's an unprovoked authoritarian nuclear power invading a sovereign nation, bringing war to Europe for the first time in over 20 years. Yes, it is a huge deal to the Jewish community because it's where so many of our ancestors fled and such a sizable Jewish community remains, where so many of us with Ashkenazi roots know deep down that had our families somehow miraculously escaped the jaws of history from the Shoah and Soviet repression, that those Ukrainian Jews could be us. And as we heard already this evening, we know that far more people in the United States and Europe are responding to Ukraine's refugees the way they should because the vast majority are white. Polling shows sky-high bipartisan support for welcoming Ukrainians, while those numbers plummet for Afghans, Syrians, and virtually anyone with darker skin or proximity to the Spanish language and Islam. As we dig deeper into this crisis, let's keep in mind that we must learn 
from our response for Ukrainian refugees to build upon the chance to live out our Jewish values of Betzelem Elohim, that we are all made in the same image, of Tzedek Tzedek Tiogdov, of justice, justice you shall pursue, and of course Tikkun Olam to repair the world, in which the Naomi's and Ruth's can build new lives. After all, we are commanded to welcome the stranger no fewer than 36 times in the Torah. Now with that context, here's what's happening with Ukraine and around it. Over 6.9 million people have fled Ukraine since Putin invaded, nearly two thirds of them to Poland alone. And there's very little awareness that an additional nearly 8 million people are internally displaced within Ukraine itself. This war sparked the largest refugee crisis in Europe since World War II and the fastest forced displacement in human history. Yes, we have seen some high profile Americans like First Lady Dr. Jill Biden and Speaker Pelosi and Secretaries Austin and Blinken visit Kyiv and the US has reopened its embassy there. But the war remains far from over. Russia is no longer attacking Kyiv, even Kharkiv in the east, but it's causing irreparable damage in Ukraine's east and south, where it controls 20% of all Ukrainian territory. Shortages of food, shelter, and medical supplies persist in many parts of the country. LGBTQ people are at severe risk wherever Putin's army advances. Hundreds of thousands of people have been kidnapped by Putin's regime in eastern Ukraine and forced to be fake refugees in Russia itself to uphold Kremlin propaganda. Since men ages 18 to 60 are banned from leaving the country, those fleeing are women, children, and older people, all of whom are significantly susceptible to human trafficking. Hayes is taking a three-pronged approach to the crisis in response to Ukraine, supporting those displaced within Ukraine itself, helping refugees in immediately neighboring countries, and then resettlement in the rest of Europe, Israel, and the United States. Hayes is no stranger to Ukraine. In fact, it was the first Tsarist anti-Semitic pogroms in the 1880s in what is now Ukraine that sparked Hayes's creation as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, we just go by our acronym now, because the Jewish community mobilized out of existential necessity to help our people reach shelter, safety, and self-sufficiency out of harm's way. And yet even as we've grown into an agency spanning five continents in 17 countries, our commitment to Ukraine has never wavered. We've helped people flee pogroms, Nazis, Soviets, and Putin's invasion of the Donbas and Crimea in 2014. In 2001, we established an office in Kyiv to help Ukrainian Jews and other religious minorities seeking to migrate to the United States and later help those from across the Middle East, Africa, and Asia seeking asylum in Ukraine. In 2014, we transformed our highest Ukraine office into Right to Protection, R2P, an independent Ukrainian NGO providing legal and humanitarian aid to those internally displaced from Putin's first Ukraine invasion with 10 offices across the country and 162 staff. R2P remains an inextricable part of the highest family. Most R2P staff evacuated to Lviv and elsewhere in Western Ukraine, bravely helping Ukraine's internally displaced people while being displaced themselves. Hayes will continue serving as R2P's primary fundraiser and representative abroad. We've also deployed our own staff to Ukraine to strengthen coordination. Hayes and R2P are especially on the front lines of fighting for our many asylum seeker clients from outside of Europe who are now experiencing well-documented racial discrimination within Ukraine and its neighbors whilst trying to seek safety from Putin's violence. We are indeed seeing many Ukrainians repatriate, but substantial numbers of these Naomi's and Ruth's are 
going to Ukraine's west, not their homes in the south and east, meaning that there will continue to be millions of internally displaced people exactly where most of Hyas and R2P staff are based. And they will be on the front lines, providing cash-based assistance, support in the face of deep psychological traumas, fighting to address the acute housing shortage that now persists within Western Ukraine because of this unprecedented strain, and preparing these individuals for becoming refugees should they choose to cross international borders. Once the invasion began, Hyas established partnerships with Jewish community organizations in Moldova, Poland, Slovakia, and Romania to ensure that they had the infrastructure to welcome refugees of all backgrounds. We're seeing countries that Jews once fled transform into safe havens for and in, excuse me, safe havens for Jews seeking refuge, Jews and non-Jews alike. Hayes partnered with leaders such as the Chief Orthodox Rabbi of Poland to provide extensive technical support to transform their communal institutions into humanitarian aid providers. The world-renowned Jewish Community Center in Krakow mobilized to collect essential items like food, diapers, and medicine and turn their building into refugee housing. As their director of programming put it, we are now living a refugee Shabbat 24-7, noting that Putin invaded barely a week before the Jewish communities around the world observed refugee Shabbat. My boss and vice president recently finished a massive multi-day training in France and will soon have another in Belgium with Jewish community leadership from across the continent to discuss private sponsorship and resettlement. The welcome circle model, which is being used to help resettle Afghans and now Ukrainians in the United States, is being adapted and implemented by different and local European communities to receive Ukrainian newcomers. And I'm going to get to welcome circles a bit more later. In Israel, home to Hyas's oldest country office and a nation that Hyas helped establish by resettling millions of refugees during every wave of Aliyah, even predating the country's independence, Hyas has launched successful impact litigation to secure rights for non-Jewish Ukrainians seeking refuge from Putin's invasion. For those who may not be as familiar, Israel's home to upwards of a million Jews from the former Soviet Union, and tens of thousands of them have non-Jewish spouses. Naturally, there are many uh, Ukrainians who are fleeing to the only other place on earth where they have family. And thanks to my colleagues who have mobilized new legions of pro bono attorneys from Israel's robust tech community, many more have secured the right to safety. The refugee crisis from Ukraine has exposed the broader Israeli public, the inequities in the country's immigration system that Hayas has fought for years to change on behalf of tens of thousands of asylum seekers from Eritrea and Sudan, as well as openly LGBTQ people from the Palestinian territories. My Israeli colleagues are wasting no time to educate our new partners in the tech industry to leverage their resources on behalf of other vulnerable populations as we continue to build towards an Israel that lives up to the Zionist dream of a safe and welcoming Jewish democracy. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, Hayes has advocated to the, for the Biden administration to resettle Ukrainian refugees. Finally, two whole months after the war began, the administration launched the new Uniting for Ukraine program, which will save thousands of lives. Practically speaking, the process is intended to provide speedy entry, but people will only be granted temporary humanitarian parole rather, rather than permanent status. Uniting for Ukraine is not a panacea. This announcement is against a backdrop of 14 million Ukrainians displaced and entire cities and towns destroyed. And like most refugees, Ukrainians may want to go home quickly, but as I made clear, in too many cases, there's no more safe home to return to within Ukraine itself. Individuals or organizations in America who sponsor Ukrainians must prove that they have enough wealth to ensure that Ukrainians won't become public charges, a policy once used to deny entry to Jewish refugees fleeing Nazis. Resorting to humanitarian parole means putting Ukrainians into our overwhelmed immigration courts to seek asylum, which is a wholly insufficient way to ensure that new arrivals have access to the support and any sense of self-determination that they deserve. Work authorization 
will also take months to secure through adjudication. And the US government isn't matching Ukrainians with sponsors, it's forcing all of us in the NGO sector to do so. It means that we can't have all the data that we usually would for how many refugees will come to the United States and when, where, making it harder to implement resettlement plans as they're completely different from the conventional US refugee admissions program. We were also alarmed by the Biden administration's focus on urging Ukrainians to not seek protection at the US-Mexico border, especially because all of us live in California. I want you to all, if there's one thing you remember from my talk, it's actually this. Seeking asylum is a legal right unanimously passed by Congress into law under the 1980 Refugee Act. Congress passed something unanimously in some of our lifetimes. We should equitably extend protections to refugees fleeing violence and persecution around the world, full stop, no matter their race, nationality, or ethnicity. Even with these many challenges, Hyas is rapidly mobilizing the American Jewish community to resettle Ukrainians. And as I speak, we are ramping up efforts to build out Hyas welcome circles for Ukrainians, and I'm dangling it in front of you again. I'm gonna go into those details again shortly. Ukraine was home to 44 million people and roughly 200,000 Jews, depending on how you count. It's home to the seventh largest Jewish community on the planet. The pin I'm wearing says, my people were refugees too. And it does deeply pain me to say that my people are refugees again. And I want to make one point abundantly clear. Hyas and our many different Jewish community partners and non-Jewish community partners are on the ground working day and night to help every person fleeing Ukraine, Jews and non-Jews alike. They must get access to the safety and refuge that they deserve. There are too many, both within our community and outside of it, who view this work as an either or proposition. But at Hyas, it isn't always we'll be moving forward a both and. We must continue our tradition of welcoming the Ruths and Naomi's in our broken world. Besides, most of the solutions to help Jews and non-Jews are the same. Whether a refugee simply wants to get to Poland, America, or Israel, they all must travel by land to escape Ukraine. The skies are closed. Ukraine called Ukraina in both Ukrainian and Russian, my apologies if I mispronounce it to those who speak either language, it literally means borderland. Yes, geopolitically it means the borderland of many different empires that ruled over it, from Russians to Poles to back to Russians and Soviets and Nazis and Soviets again. It's also the borderland of fragile democracy and authoritarianism. Just as Israel translates to to struggle with God, I see another meaning with Ukraine for the Jewish community today. We are confronting the borderlands of our own emotional and intellectual challenges as Jews, of recognizing the need, the necessity, to stand up for our own people and for others. We're at the borderlands of the universalist and particularist experiences that shape Jewish history, culture, and values. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, the Jewish grandson of a Holocaust survivor, lives both literally and figuratively in those borderlands. As a Jew, I take enormous pride in Zelensky fighting for his own diaspora community, proving, excuse me, diaspora country, proving that we Jews can be accepted and admired by billions around the globe and inspire fear in authoritarian dictators. If Zelensky can fight for Ukrainians of all backgrounds, of Jews and non-Jews, then so can we. Months before any one of us who isn't in the CIA knew of imminent threat to Ukraine, our Jewish community mobilized to welcome the stranger. American Jews have played a massive and disproportionate role in empowering the 76th thousand Afghans airlifted to the United States after the fall of Kabul. Why? Because it's who we are as Jews. 
to pull from Hatikva, welcoming the stranger gets to the core of Nefesh Yehudi, the soul of the Jew. And it gets right to the heart of who we are as Americans too. We have the obligation to welcome the stranger, especially those who put their lives on the line for our country, for NATO, especially NATO now, and humanitarian NGOs over the past two decades. The journey to help Afghan refugees hasn't been easy. Our resettlement system was gutted under the previous administration. In the 2020 to 2021 fiscal year, I promise I'm not gonna quiz you on any of this later, we only welcomed 11,000 refugees, down from a bipartisan average of 95,000. Yes, now we have an ostensibly pro-refugee administration which reset refugee admissions to 125,000 for the new fiscal year that began on October 1st, meaning that critical funding would be released to NGOs like Hyatt's and our many partners on the ground to hire case managers, social workers, translators, and others in the public-private partnership that defines refugee resettlement. Then we could go off into the sunset, rebuild the system, and live happily ever after, right? Except that is so not what happened. We all saw that Kabul fell in mid-August, six weeks before the new fiscal year, and the administration didn't have an evacuation plan. Normally, a resettlement agency has a lead of at least 10 days to three weeks before new clients arrive. But when 76,000 arrived all at once to a deeply atrophied system, the system was completely unprepared. Given the unprecedented strain on the system, a solution known as sponsor circles has been pioneered across the United States, modeled on the private sponsorship program that's wildly popular in Canada. With deep experience in refugee resettlement and honed strategies for educating, organizing, and mobilizing the Jewish community, we launched the Highest Welcome Circle program. There are 32 circles nationwide, and 14 of them are here in Southern California. And here's where you come in. We've launched Highest Welcome Circles for Ukrainians. You too can work with us to form groups of five to eight people, usually associated with a Jewish organization like a synagogue or local chapter of an advocacy organization like NCJW. Uh, multiple synagogues can band together to do this as well. To form a mini agency to resettle a family over a minimum of six months. Circles do everything from assisting with finding housing, enrollment in social programs, and registering for schools. The core group of volunteers go through training from HIAS, get access to a national community of practice online platform to exchange best practices with other circles to share resources and have technical liaisons to work with who will assist them through the private sponsorship process. Circles raise money that's kept in-house to help the refugees not given to HIAS so that housing and other basic needs are covered. Hyas also needs financial support for millions of Ukrainians who won't be coming to the United States. Cash is often the best thing to give people in crisis, empowering them with the agency of choosing what they need most. And, and this really works not just for Hyas, but any organization that's on the ground right now. Because cash-based support staves off deeply anti the pervasive anti-refugee politics in host countries. And as was mentioned earlier, remember, Poland turned literal fire hoses against Syrian and Afghan asylum seekers at its border with Belarus back in November. Those politics can flip on a dime. And the cash-based support also sustains Ukraine's own economy so that it can continue to be sustained for those who are choosing to stay within its borders. And besides, our supply chains are very stretched. We don't need to be adding more <laughs> um, strain on those systems. And the last thing that virtually any humanitarian NGO is going to need right now is the logistical burden of airlifting goods to the region. Funding also ensures that we can implement critical mental health programs, prevention of domestic violence, and protection of women, girls, and LGBTQ people, as well as continue mobilizing our long-term resettlement efforts across the globe. And donations may not always feel great, but the impact is powerful. We also need your help in advocacy. Whether or not you form a highest welcome circle, our elected officials need to hear from you about the absolute necessity to welcome the stranger so that we have policies that are better equipped to do so. 
let's remember that the entire resettlement system was established by the UN in the 1951 Geneva Convention on Refugees, signed by both the United States and Israel, in explicit response to what happened to Jews in the Shoah, because our people didn't have the legal framework to safely flee. Despite the system's imperfections and many governments' resistance to enforce it, now we Jews and all people have the obligation to sustain and improve it. So as we navigate the borderlands of these uncertain times, may we find strength in our Jewish identity, our history, and our culture. Welcoming the stranger, the Ruths and Naomi's in our midst is who we are. Toda Okay, great. We have 10 minutes for some, for some questions, and, and I hope you can keep them as actual questions so I can get to more people. Uh, we are certainly, um, I believe, don't, and please don't quote me entirely on this, but I think we're now in the 130 to 150 million range right now on, on a global basis. Um, and so we're, and, and for Ukraine specifically, we are looking to raise uh, about 40 million, and we are at about 30 million to get there. Or we've raised 30 million, we just have 10 million more to go. Um, as the only LA-based staffer at Hyas, um, I, I, you're not the first to ask questions about that. And, and, um, and, 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 and related to that, um, you know, there are people who will then say, how do we welcome people here if we have our own crises here, even people who want to support. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We deal with a lot of crises all at once, and we often don't have the luxury to pick and choose. Um, and, and, uh, but, but it is something that, um, Believe me, I would love to bring more colleagues and staff. We're headquartered in Silver Spring, Maryland, outside of DC, and we have our, uh, what I call HQ2 in New York City, um, where all my bosses are. And uh, you know, I would love to have more people out here, because I think you know, th there are so many intersections of this work with many others, and housing is absolutely one of them. In fact, one of the things a lot of people ask me you know, they'll say, I don't have an accessory dweller unit in, on my property. I don't have an apartment that I can give to someone. I already, you know, went to my lobby meetings with, with my, you know, federal legislators. What else can I do? And I always tell people, go to any meeting that has to do with building more housing in your communities. We need to increase our housing supply. Housing policy is immigration policy. If we don't build more housing, we're basically saying that California is only going to welcome you if you, you know, you could be any identity, any nationality, any, co you know, skin color, any sexual orientation, any gender, but you must be rich. And I think that that is not who we want to be as a state. So I'm really glad you, you raised that issue. So all the technical liaisons who'd be working with you, the, um, the, we have regular office hours that are conducted all through Zoom. So we have people who are working with us across the country who work with all the different, excuse me, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna keep knocking these things so I talk with my hands. They, you know, the, you get all the support. I actually am not the one providing all the support to our welcome circles because we have people who have experience in refugee resettlement uh, from many of our Many of them are people who came out of retirement because they used to run our local affiliates. Uh, for example, Jewish Family Service of LA for many years was the highest affiliate. You can think of it as a subcontractor. Um, and under the, the previous administration, when refugee numbers uh, were gutted, uh, that, was, that program had to end. But 
um, people at different programs like that are now, you know, who used to run the resettlement, for example, at JFS uh, in Pittsburgh, they came out of retirement and are now consulting and working with our welcome circles to make sure they get the resources they need. One of the things we've learned from this pandemic is how many resources can be, and, and support can be provided online and digitally. There are a lot of people who are very active in circles that particularly when it comes to helping with dealing with bureaucracy and paperwork and just being the go-getters to make sure everyone is on task with getting what needs to get done, those are all things that can happen from home without interacting with others. So people who are immunocompromised can still be engaged. So it's really something where you're getting support from Highest National, uh, whereas I'm the one speaking to communities like yours to bring you into the system. And, and then you get the support from, from people nationally. Uh, so it's a blend. We are, uh, one of our biggest funders is the UN High Commission on Refugees. Uh, we are now one of the largest humanitarian agencies in Latin America. And so that's where a lot of our funding comes from, although it certainly does not pay for my salary. My, mine is all from private donations. Uh, the, the U.S. government does fund some of our work, certainly for resettlement. Uh, but especially in the last two years, we've seen a substantial shift um, of a percentage increase in private donations. And, and they're playing an ever engaged with us and, and, and empowering us to scale uh, the work that we've been doing all around the world. I think I saw one other hand, and, and then we'll call time. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. So, uh, forgive me, because I, I, I heard a few sneezes that covered, but I want to make sure I understood. So the question was, um, if you are, you know, your limited time, what are things you could do to help, um, you know, is it support highest, and, and do you help all refugees or certain populations? Um, you can do any of the above. So right now, um, you can give, absolutely, please, we, we always appreciate the support, and it can help refugees of all backgrounds from anywhere around the world uh, in where we operate. And um, I will say, if um, you know Temple Aliyah or Temple Aliyah and Shomrei Torah or Shomrei Torah, if you know any of them decide to form a welcome circle, to donate directly towards that effort as well. So as much as I would love to raise more money for Hyas, that's always great. That's actually not my main focus. I'm community engagement, not development. Um, you know, the, I, I really want to stress that that also is going to be a really good use. And what is really special for a lot of the synagogue communities we work with is how much it has transformed a lot of their own communities. They're doing the work themselves as a synagogue in partnership with us. But it's, it's them, it's, their, it's your community. And, and I think that that's something worth investing into. So I think with that, I'm happy to see the Bima. <laughs> Thank you so much to Joe Goldman from Hyas. We really appreciate your sharing with us this evening and spending your time to be here. We are going to continue with Mari followed by Havdalah. You may have noticed that we've made some shifts to the schedule, but don't worry, all of the sessions are still happening. So the teachers you were excited about learning with, you will still have those opportunities. Um, but we're going to start now with Mari. We are going to turn to page 39A for the uh, Baruch Hu. Please rise. Baruch Hu et Adonai Amavorach, Baruch Adonai Amavorach, Baruch. 
Baruch Adonai HaMavorach Le'olam Vahed Please be seated. Baruch Adonai Page forty. <laughs> Oh, Yisrael, 41. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha v'chol levavcha u'v'chol nafshecha u'v'chol me'odecha v'hayu ha'dvarim ha'ele asher anuchim hetzavecha ayom alivavecha v'shinan ta'am livanecha v'dibar ta'bam Veshitecha v'veitecha u'velechtecha v'aderech u'veshoch becha u'vekumecha u'kshar tam le'ot al yodecha v'hayu letotafot bein einecha u'chtav tam al mezuzah v'veitecha u'visharecha Page <laughs> Adonai Elohechem Emet. Please turn to page 43a. Then when I call the Bible, I'm going to go. Page 44. Moshe Umiriam, Umene Yisrael Echan Ushira, Besim Haraba, Veameru Hulam, Mika Moha Baeli Madonai, Mika Moha Nedar Bakodesh, No Ratihilo, O Yisrael <laughs> Ashki <laughs> Page 46. Please rise. 
וידבר משה את מועדי אדוני אל בני ישראל. Remain standing. גדגל אבי קדש מרבה ויאמר דברי תירותי ויאמר להתמכותי וחייכון ובמכון וחייכון לבית ישראל בעגלה ובזמן קריב ואמרו אמן יהי שמי רבה מבורך לעולם ולעולמי עולמיה יתברך וישתבח וידבר ותרמם וינשא וידדר ויתעלה ויתעלה שמי לכור אישה בריחו לילה מן כבר כתב ושירתה תשבחת אבניך מצד אמירן בעלמה ואמרו אמן. We turn now to page 306 as we remain standing for the Amidah. יעלה ויבוא ויגיד לאור ויהיה בסופו של שם. עושה שלום, שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה, יעשה שלום, הוא יעשה שלום, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. ואמרו אמן. If you're still davening, please continue. We'll continue now with the Kaddish Shalem, page 54. יתגדל ויקרא שמי רבה, ואמרתי ותירותי, ואני מתמקצה בך יכון וממקון וחי וכל בית ישראל, בעגלה ובזמן קריב, אמרו אמן. יהי שמי רבה מבורך לעלם ולעלמי עלמיה. יתברך וישתבח ויתבואר ותרומה ונעשה ויתדר ויתעלה ותלב שמי לקודשה בריחו לעיל אמין כה בחצה ושירתה תשפחת אבניך מעטה דמירן בעלמה ואמרו אמן תתקבל צלות הון ורון לכל בית ישראל ובואו מן שמיא ואמרו אמן יהא שלום אחר רבה מן שמיא וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל ואמרו אמן עושה שלום במרומיו הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן.
prize for Kiddush, which may be found on page 79. And we add for Saturday night, Baharuchat Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Meorei Haish. Baharuchat Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamavdil ben Kodesh lechol, ben Oy lechoshech, ben Yisrael leamim, ben Yom HaShevi'i lesheshet yamei hamasei. Ben Kedushat Shabbat Likdushat Yom Tov Hivdalta, Bet Yom HaShevi Lesheshet Yemei HaMasei Kiddashta, Hivdalta Vekiddashta, Et Amecha Yisrael Bikdushatecha. Baruch Ata Adonai, Hamavdil Ben Kodesh LeKodesh. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehecheyanu, Vekiyamanu, Vehegiyanu, I invite those who are, who are in mourning, those who have a yard site, to please rise and join me in the recitation of the Mourner's Cottage, found on page 58. Yitgadal v'yitgadash shemei rabba, v'yalama divra kirute v'yamnich machute, v'chayechon v'yomechon v'chaye dechol beit Yisrael, v'agala v'yizman kari v'imru amen. Yehe Shme Rabba Mevorach Lealam Ulalame Alamaya Yit Barach Vishtabach Vit Paav Vit Romam Vit Nase 
Reeta da vit ala vit halal, Shmeid kucha rehu, La ela min kobirhata vishirata, Tush behata venehemata, Da amiran be alama, Bimru amen. Yehe shlama raba min shemaya, Vechaim alenu vel ko Israel, Bimru amen. O se shalom bimromav, Hu ya a se shalom, Alenu vel ko Israel. Amen. All right, so the times you have listed in front of you are not correct, but the sessions are. Um, so I want to give a second for Rabbi Kamras and Hazan Mimi to each give a one sentence description of what their sessions are so you know. Um, Rabbi Kamras's session entitled, What Judaism Teaches Us About the Ger, the Stranger, Who They Are, and What Is Our Responsibility to Them. That's going to be here in the sanctuary, not in the classroom, but just right here. Fazan Mimi's session, um, the mindfulness and healing service for Shavuot in Ukraine, will be taking place in the chapel. You can just exit through that door um, and meet her in the chapel. So, Rabbi Kamras, could you give us a one sentence about your session? Yeah. Beautiful. Hazan Mimi? Thank you. Beautiful. So those sessions will be beginning at 9.15. We'll give everyone a little time to get to the right place, and they'll be 45 minutes long. So they'll finish at um, 10 o'clock, and then you'll have five minutes to get to your next spot. And at 10.05, the next sessions will begin. Um, Rabbi Adam Schaefer will be teaching here in the sanctuary, A Dangerous Crossroads, Russia, Ukraine, and Anti-Zionism. And Rabbi Stuart Vogel will be teaching in the classroom, um, kind of across the way, about Jewish laws of warfare dealing with sexual abuse. That will be beginning at 10.05. Rabbi Adam, could you give us a one sentence? Thanks. And Rabbi Vogel. So a lot of amazing sessions to choose from. Just to review the time, and I apologize that it's not what you have written in front of you, 9.15 to 10 o'clock will be Rabbi Kamras and Hazan Mimi, either in the chapel or here in the sanctuary. Then you'll have five minutes to get to your next spot. 10.05 to 10.50, another 45-minute session, will be either here in the sanctuary with Rabbi Adam or in the classroom with Rabbi Vogel. Um, and at 10.50, there will be cheesecake. In addition to all the cookies and tea and coffee and snacks that have already been out, we'll have some time for cheesecake and, and schmoozing, and then we'll come back here for a final session. Um, so five minutes, and uh, we'll see you either here or in the chapel.
here, even though I prefer to be down there, but because we're live streaming it, I'm going to speak from here so that all of you who are sitting at home, hopefully watching us, we can um, feel that you are part of this moment. So, as you saw a little bit earlier, there was supposed to be um, a different schedule, which you have in your hands. Um, and as it turns out, Daniel and Alina just arrived from San Gabriel, wherever it is they came from, to be here. So I want to have time both for the session that I'm going to be teaching, but I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to do it in about 30, 35 minutes. And I want to give Daniel and Alina, who were once upon a time refugees to this country, um, who came from Russia, um, an opportunity to share what their experience was and what perhaps we can do as a community. Because I really want to push us, after hearing from Joe tonight, to consider Temple Aliyah, Shomrei Torah, synagogue together, creating a welcoming circle for if the opportunity avails itself to house, host and house uh, Ukrainian refugees or Afghani refugees. There are so many needs. And I would like our communities to come together to do that. So what does it mean specifically? I want to give Daniel and Alina, who are members of Shomrei Torah Synagogue, um, and their daughter was just bought mitzvah a, a week ago, an opportunity to share uh, a little bit of their experience and what we might be able to learn from them. So Alina and Daniel, come on up. And then um, in about, I would say, at 9.30ish, then I'll jump in and we'll take a look at some of these sources. So, I mean, it's a little bit strange for us to describe refugee experience after having it um, after 30 years. <laughs> so, but um, uh, if we were to, and another point about refugee experience for us is that um, different from the current, uh, current refugees from uh, Ukraine is that refugees from Ukraine right now are running from real uh, military conflict. So they are in real distress and um, kind of running, uh, leaving everything behind, leaving their families, leaving their friends, leaving all of their possessions and uh, running to any country where, where that, would, that could take them. The difference in our, uh, in our scenario was that uh, we're running from anti-Semitism, uh, systemic anti-Semitism that was in the country that prevented us from achieving what we could achieve. But at the same time, we were not running in the same manner as the re refugees from Ukraine are running. So they are uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> I don't want to compare our experience with their experience because they're in much, uh, they're really in distress, right? While uh, we had a very limited opportunities, but at the same time, we took time to, to arrive here. Well, I guess we should probably start with introducing ourselves and describing a little bit of where we come from. So um, I was actually yeah. born and raised in Russia, in Moscow, uh, yet both of my parents are from the Ukraine and all of our extended family um, was uh, living in the Ukraine. When I was growing up, I was the first sort of generation born in Russia. So still have pretty close connections. Um, thankfully, most of my family is uh, not in the Ukraine anymore, just some distant cousins left yet we still have lots of friends and family here whose close family and friends are in the Ukraine. Um, so uh, that, that, that's, that's part of the story. Then, um, so personally we, it, it was, I came to, um, I came here with my family with the refugee status as many Jews uh, did in the 90s. That was sort of the big wave of immigration, Jewish immigration from uh, the Soviet Union, all parts of the Soviet Union, right? Because at the time it was sort of one country, we viewed ourselves as part of one and the same country. And when you were Jewish, it didn't really matter where you lived, whether you were in Russia, in Belarus, in Ukraine, or in many other parts of the Soviet Union. What united us was the fact that we were Jewish. And uh, being a refugee was sort of a political way of entering the country. 
because uh, immigration into the US was, uh, and is still is pretty restricted. So you could come in as a refugee at the time if you could prove that you have a refugee status and the way you proved it is first of all, you had to have a direct relations here. So which uh, constituted parents and children and siblings. And so my mother had her brother living here and which is how we could apply for a refugee status. And you did it while living in the Soviet Union. And like Daniel said, you know, yes, there was lots of reasons why we wanted to leave the Soviet Union at the time, but being afraid for our lives, uh, being part of the military conflict was not one of them. So you had to do that as, a, as part of, you know, pol sitting poli uh, seeking political refugee status, again, is, is a means of entering the country. And so what that gave you is a way to come here legally um, and the right to work, right? So you essentially we were eligible to work on day one, which is the biggest sort of distinction with having a refugee status when you enter in the United States versus just being able to come as many of the Ukrainian refugees and Afghan refugees are able, so you, you can enter the country legally, but you still have to wait quite some time to start to be able to work in the country, which for us was different. And uh, my story was a little bit different. Uh, I came from Riga, Latvia, uh, which was also part of the Soviet Union. Uh, I came without family. I came uh, uh, by myself. My parents stayed behind. Um, and but otherwise, it's uh, kind of similar to what was uh, to what Irina described, just uh, with a uh, refugee status, which you have to wait back in Soviet Union then to uh, to arrive to the states. And um, kind of looking back on that experience, um, back there, what would have, what would have been most uh, beneficial and uh, heartwarming, I would say, is um, uh, having somebody explain the life the way it is here. Because the difference is so stark and it's so difficult to understand even some of the very basic things, something that we living here um, comes to us naturally and, and uh, understandable. It's this, the educational system, the healthcare system, the credit system uh, is very different from what uh, the refugees from Ukraine or from that part of the world are used to or understand. Well, and, and uh, to some degree, it was even more different 30 years ago. It's actually yeah. um, probably a little bit, the world has converged quite a bit in the last you know, three decades, right? And up until the war, life in the Ukraine and, and sort of it, it was becoming more westernized, right? And so another thing that's happening too is, a, you know, because the, the economy and the world and, and and the political system has developed quite a bit in the parts of the former Soviet Union, especially in the Ukraine. Um, the people coming in will most likely be pretty well educated and will have some, um, probably significant, uh, majority of them will have some language skills as well, right? Which is gonna come very handy for uh, their ability to assimilate here and uh, you know they're they'll, they they should at least have some you know, valuable skill sets that will help them integrate into the society quite a bit. Go on. Um, again, it's we, it's we clearly didn't script it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so again, going back to our history. So I was 18 when I came here. I actually started college in Russia. So I was coming here after you know going to school there for a year. So what was very beneficial for me coming in is figuring out how do I continue the education here, right? That was like, the, the, that was the biggest issue for me. And actually coming here, we had family here. So again, it's a very different experience. But more so when we came here, you know, as, as most Russian Jews at the time, we settled in West Hollywood, which was, you know, part of the big Russian Jewish community. So actually living in the area that was part of the community and making friends there, with people similar experiences, even though they were also fresh off the boat, but having people like like-minded people coming sort of from the same background, same experience, and dealing with the same issues at the same time as a community was very helpful to us, right? So it's, yes, it's one thing that, of course, you need people to explain things to you, 
but it's also good, it, it, it's also very beneficial to be surrounded by a community of people going through similar experiences. So housing one family versus housing several families, right, or welcoming several families at the time would make transition for those families also a lot easier. Because as much as, you know, you can spend a lot of time trying to explain things and trying to show people the way and welcome them and whatnot, they will still perceive this differently and it will take some time to really even understand what it is you're trying to explain to them and all these new things that, are, it, it's just so new and the lifestyle is so new and they have so many objectives um, and so many uh, problems to solve right away and so many issues to accommodate. It also obviously very much depends on the structure of the family you're housing. Do they have young children? Do they have school-aged children? Do they have college-aged children? Do they have elderly parents? So it also depends, right? So obviously, you know, pairing them up and surrounding them with people with, in a similar stage in life, with again, similar sort of, uh, you know, family structures, right? So that they can ask questions that are most relevant to that family and to all the, you know, all the members of that family at the time is important. Yeah. Does that answer? So each of the family's needs will be, uh, which will be very unique, right? And um, as um, as probably should be expected, they will they are most will be concerned less with. I mean, of course, they they will have like immediate needs, um, you know, economical needs and whatever they will need. But the most thing is how do we look for a job, connections? How do we? What's our next step? What's our next step should be? So any help in that way, that's, that's what they will be looking for uh, right away, which, you know, that's, they're less looking for a kind of more immediate help. They're less looking for a fish more to teach them how to fish. Yes. Yes, it will be very helpful, especially 30 years ago when we came in, when it was still kind of Soviet Union and immediate, immediate post-Soviet times, there was still a wave of immigration and naturally there was new immigrants part of the community. Hundreds and thousands of people yeah. and again, and you could sort of find like-minded people. You can find, you can meet people your age and you know, our parents and grandparents had a community, you know, we as, as you know, Young adults had a community of kids. When they started school, they had a community of kids, you know, but coming from the similar experiences. Whether that's possible to do now or not, you know, but if, if at all possible, that would make the transition and assimilation a lot easier. Yeah, it, w it was much easier back then. Like the big first step for me was finding a roommate when I just arrived. And through Jewish Family Service, somebody already asked that question and they connected us very quickly. Right now, I think it would be much more challenging and it will take a lot more time. So, uh, I think over the past 30 years, the kind of former Russian, Ukrainian, former Soviet Union community grew quite a bit. So, there is still kind of the enclave in uh, in uh, West, West Hollywood, Hollywood, but I think there are large community in the valley. There's uh, uh, in the mid in the mid. There's community in the mid city. There's uh, there's yeah. there's a lot of. The, the, the reality is that again, the Russian community as we know it, right? So majority is like 30 years old, right? Meaning it, it's the immigration wave that happened 30 years ago. So yes, we s we, we will still speak the language with people coming in. But it's it's going to be you know culturally as different to them. We're going to be as different to them as most of you, right? It's 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 different. Plus, the Jewish community is going to be different from you know the non-Jewish people coming from the Ukraine. It's culturally very different. So we have the benefit of coming into a Jew Russian Jewish community or whatever you want to call it, right? So that was and and you know having assistance and resources of the Jewish Family Service. So, um, 
at least there was some kind of centralized effort to help integrate and again and help connect all of us. This is a very different situation you'd be dealing with now. So again, I want to thank Alina and Danielle, and I also want to apologize because the way the schedule originally was set up is not the way that it has run, but I want to thank all of you also for accommodating the slight changes, and again, just gives us an opportunity to think clearly that um, how many of you were born in this country? Well, let me ask it a different way. How many of you were not born in this country? Okay, so the vast majority of people here have been born in this country. Um, therefore, the vast majority of us know and are comfortable understanding what it means to live as citizens in this country. And for many of you who raised your hands who were not born in this country, you probably came in not as refugees, but as immigrants coming to this country for a variety of reasons. So it does just give us pause to think about how challenging it's going to be for the Ukrainians, and God willing, our two synagogues will be able to come together, we'll be in touch with Hyas, I'll be in touch with Hyas, and if anybody wants to help me in this process, and I'm gonna certainly recruit um, Daniel and Alina, and if there are others who would like to help in um, figuring out what our communities can do together, uh, let me and Rabbi Vogel know. Bruce, yes. <laughs> It's true, because it's not the same. You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, this country and California are two different uh, worlds. So for those of you who have moved to California, you know that. Um, it's interesting, because the text that I want to look at this evening, and for those of you who are online, I realized um, halfway through that I should have provided an opportunity online also. But if you have a Tanakh near you, if you have a Torah near you, you can open up to Genesis to break sheet chapter 12 verses 1 through 4 because that's where we're going to begin because I think this text in particular is a particularly telling text for us as Jews and just for um, ease of time knowing that we have such little time we're only looking at the English tonight but I'm sure all of you can fluently read it in the Hebrew as well and so if you want to see it in the Hebrew you can open up the Humash that is in front of your seats. Thank you, Rabbi. So page 69, the Eternal said to Avram, and we know the Hebrew probably well, right? Lech lecha, lech lecha, go forth from your land, from your birthplace, from the house of your father to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will expand your name. And it will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And all the families of the world will bless you. Avram went uh, when the Eternal spoke to him. So, you know, in thinking about this class, I um, was trying to think how to begin. And I chose this verse, these verses, because I think they are particularly insightful and telling to us as Jews with regard to the refugee or migrant or stranger or gear status. Um, how does this text, I ask the question, provide context for what it means to be a Jew in this text? What does it mean, according to this passage, to be a Jew? Why do you say Rahmanis? wholeheartedly with what Bruce said, but why? Yeah, Ellen. So I'm going to repeat everything, so for those that are online who can't hear um, the comments, I'm going to repeat the comments, but I'm going to slightly rephrase the comments. I hope that's okay with you. What I'm hearing Ellen saying is that 
we'll never know the backstory, the full backstory of why people move, why people choose to move, or why people must move. But for most of those people, there is some kind of call. There's some kind of deeper understanding. There's some vision internally or externally from God that motivates that move. Sometimes it's a matter of choice. Sometimes it's not a matter of choice. Sometimes it's a matter of, I have no choice, but to save myself, I have to move. And in the context of Avraham and God saying to him, it's not necessarily a physical fear of Avraham moving, but it is an existential one. Avraham cannot be who he needs to be unless he moves in order to fulfill his particular mission in this world, entailed in that is an immigrant status, to be a stranger, to move from everything that he knows, everything that he's familiar with, everything that he's comfortable with, and move to some place absolutely, completely foreign to him. In our case, it wasn't out of physical, as I said, it was out of spiritual, emotional, religious, and whatever else. Yeah, I don't know your name. Tell me your name. Paula. Paula. Um, I also think that if you can't be a stranger to the things Beautiful. Beautiful. So Paula says that what, regardless of whether it is by choice or not by choice, as you said with the Ukrainian refugees, holding on to, belief in, having faith in a higher power that there is, is so essential to the ability to transform the move and find safety and security. I imagine for the two of you, Alina and Daniel, that whether it was God or a hope in some outside forces that you trusted in and had faith in that we're going to allow you to make this radical move and find a better life by coming here to the United States. So, Paul, I think you're absolutely right. Avram, we don't, we don't hear it. Avram doesn't say, but we have to assume that he was a man of faith to be able to make this kind of move. Faith enough that he experienced the call of the divine that led him to move. Anything else you see in this text? Um, Bert. Okay, good. So Bart notices, right, this is a very different kind of experience, Avram moving to the land of Canaan than the Israelites who are coming out of Egypt, because that's the other story of migration. There are two major stories for Jews at, that are the, form, the formulation or the foundation of migration. The first is Avram and Sarah, and the second is Yitziat Mitzrayim. One of them is couched in the p possibility and potentiality for transformation and blessing, this one. And the other one, which will eventually get to that point, is because we have no choice, because we were enslaved for hundreds and hundreds of years. But what do you think it means that when it says the migrant, right, the stranger, is going to be the one that brings blessing to the world. How do you link that? How do you see that? 
Is that simply just a promise of God's that if people pay attention and care for the Jewish people, then the world will be blessed, and if not, they won't be blessed? Or is there something inherent in relating to the immigrant, relating to the gear, relating to the stranger that is built into the very DNA of what the Torah is trying to get out here? Rome, I saw your hand up, and then Bruce, yeah. How do I repeat all that? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, you missed it, but it was a really important comment. What? From the, yes. There is some power in diversity that we know just from the nature of um, the way in which biology works, that, that a mingling of many is what ultimately makes all of us so much stronger. And when we remain in a more narrow sense where we push out outsiders, that leads to a weaker system than a stronger system. That's what Roma was saying. Bruce. Very nice, beautiful. So the very essence of the way we can read this text, Bruce says, is that Avraham's journey, his lech lecha, is no different paradigmatically than all of our, that every single one of us has a lech lecha moment when we come into this world. That we come into this world, in a sense, as a gear, as a stranger, into the world. And then it takes for the blessings of all around us to help us make manifest the very blessings that are in each one of us. So that every moment of human possibility is a moment of lech lecha. There is no such a thing as somebody who is not a gear. Nobody is not a stranger. Nobody hasn't moved to a foreign place and has to start over again. And in order to understand the role that we as human beings have in creating space for that gear must be built on mercy and rachamim. Very nice. Let's take a look at the second text. God gathered, um, this one I'm sorry if you're online you won't be able to find in the Tanakh. It is a Midrasha commentary on chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 13. So it's in the very beginning of the creation of the world when God is describing the nature of how the world is created. God gathered the dust of the first human from the four corners of the world, red, black, white, and green. Red is the blood, black is the innards, and green for the body. Why from the four corners of the earth? So that if one comes from the east to the west and arrives at the end of his life, as he nears departing from the world, it will not be said of him, this land is not the dust of your body, it's of mine. Go back to where you were created. Rather, every place that a person walks, from there she was created, and from there she will return. Such an incredibly powerful, powerful text in terms of understanding what it means to be a human being in this world. 
So I see some hands. Ellen, go ahead. Oh, because it says red, it defines red, black, and green, but not uh, white. I don't know. What do you think the white is? And why is it necessary to say red, black, white, and green? What's the symbolism of those colors? Hold on, Roma. Why doesn't it say what is white and what's the symbolism of those four colors? Metaphorically, what might it be speaking about in terms of the human race, the human condition, humanity in this world? Roma? Okay, so wait, let's just stop with that one. White isn't defined specifically because white includes all of the colors. Well, I don't want to, I am certainly not a, um, what is it, a physicist, a, um, a, 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 what is it? How about if we use it as both? White is all colors, white is the absence of colors. The, what is this text teaching us then about how we view color in this world. Yeah, Roma, we'll come back to that, but Roma, go ahead. Okay, let's let that, that's it. That's exactly why I brought this text. Say that again. To be a stranger is merely a tribal and social construct. Now, I don't want to say, and it's for another time and another place, that it is not essential for the world to be divided into tribes. It is essential. Nationalism is a good thing. The story of Babel teaches us that. God says that there should be a plethora of languages, a plethora of cultures, a plethora of peoples, a plethora of cultures. That's what the Tower of Babel teaches us. But before the Tower of Babel, built into, as I said, the DNA of the world, is that how we view others is a social construct. Race, for example. What does it mean that we define people by the color of their skin? Why? Why? Why is that something that matters to what it means to be a human being. You have darker skin, I have lighter skin, who cares? Skin does not define the nature of what it means to be a human being. Neither, according to this text, does the land that you live on, the land that you were born in, the land that you die in. Because what is your land? All of the earth. To be Adam is to be connected to Adama. To be a human being, Adam, is to be rooted in the earthiness of the world, regardless of where we live. Now, I'm not saying, as John Lennon said, that we should get rid of borders and that we should get, a, get rid of countries and get rid of states. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying and what this text, I think, is teaching us is that sometimes we have to live within the context of strangers. And we use that construct to say they're an immigrant and they're a stranger. Maybe we need to hold on to this very text before we jump to that conclusion. Anybody else a comment on this text? OK, well, um, we're running out of time. so. Um, Let's take a look, let's very quickly, what I want you to think about is of the 36 mentions in the Torah of how we shall treat the stranger, I've just given you a few of them, and each one of these offers us insight into what it means for us. The way in which I think God intended 
in Genesis chapter 12 when God says, I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. We have the potential to be the blessing to others who are gayrim through the specifics of the way that Torah elucidates and illustrates what it is that we need to do. There shall be one law, Exodus 12, chapter four, verse 49. There shall be one law for the citizen and for the gear who dwells among you. Meaning what? What's that? Yeah, in Joe's presentation earlier today, I heard a lot about second-class citizenship. I don't know if you heard that. I heard governments who are trying to protect the integrity of their society, right, and their citizens, citizens which I understand, but at a great expense to this very notion, there shall be one law for the citizen and one for the gear. How does that play out? How might that play out? What can we do as a community to let our elected officials understand the vision of the Torah that says, there shall be one law for the citizen and for the gear. Equality for all, especially for those who come into this country in refugee status. Especially when they come in, not because it's their choice, but because they have no choice. Because they're fleeing for their lives. Or, you shall not wrong a ger or oppress him, for you were gerim in the land of Egypt. Very different than, that was Exodus 22, 20. Very different than Exodus 12, 49. What does Exodus 22 teach us? How is it different than Exodus 12? Tell me your name. Uh, Ronit. Ronit, yes. Beautiful, thank you. Right, there's one thing that government needs to do, and we have the ability to shape the nature of the government that governs. It's another thing for us individually, personally, emotionally, to connect, to develop relationships, to reach out to those individuals. And it's not enough to say, well, if the government doesn't do what they need to do, therefore my job is done. Right? We, individually, can do so much to making somebody feel comfortable. As Daniel and Alina said earlier, right, what made the transition possible for them to succeed is the personal connections. I heard that in, in their very short 12 minutes. I heard over and over again that message that a personal connection is that which allows the immigrant, the stranger, to have the wherewithal to be able to survive that disruption in their life. That's what that second text, Roni, teaches us. Thank you. Well, um, I think, um, let's take a look. Let's skip the next one, because I have about two minutes. So let's turn to the back of the page. Um, Rabbi Jill Jacobs, who is a member of the rabbinical assembly, she is a graduate of JTS, she um, has done enormous amount of positive work in social justice work, writes, and to understand the Gare immigrant, on your own, go ahead and read Amelia Wolf's comments beforehand, because she does a beautiful job of defining the word Gare, which we generally translate as stranger, um, as um, migrant or immigrant. But so Rabbi Jill Jacobs, for the Bible, the experience of not being fully secure in Egypt obligates the Jewish people now secure in their own land to care for those who remain perpetually on the outside. Though we may reject the rabbi's disregard 
for non-Jews, we can at least learn from the rabbis that our own history of imperfection should prevent us from feeling superior to others. Not only from the perspective of Egypt, but now we have two previous texts. Genesis 1, or at least the al Shimoni, and Genesis 12 that remind us that inherent in being human and a Jew is to be the gear. Within the American context, many Jews have reinterpreted the word gear as immigrant. Here, the idea that history imposes obligations is extended to reminding Jews that our own community once occupied the position now held by newer immigrant groups. It's so difficult, it's so difficult sometimes to have empathy for those whose experiences are so vastly different than ours. Try as we might, it's not easy to stand in the shoes of another. That's why 36 times we are reminded. Because it's not so difficult for us to, be, to have that kind of empathy. Because we did experience it. And yet, most of us sitting here didn't. I asked you, how many of you are immigrants? Most of us haven't experienced it. So from a collective historical nature, we've experienced it, but individually, personally, we haven't. And yet we have. And we have to live with that duality within all the time in order to feel that sense of empathy. Or as Emmanuel Levinas, the wonderful 20th century French philosopher, suggests, and this is where I'll conclude. To punish children for the faults of their parents is less dreadful than to tolerate impunity when the stranger is injured. Fascinating. Just hold on to that. Let passers-by know this. In Israel, princes die a horrible death because strangers were injured by the sovereign. The respect for the stranger and the sanctification of the name of the eternal are strangely equivalent at the very core of what it means to be a Jew, of what it means to be a human being, is to be and have empathy for the other. And until we can have empathy for the other, we are not fulfilling what it means to be a human being and a Jew in this world. So what does that mean? That means that we have a job to do, very real in front of us, with refugees from the Ukraine, if we can, refugees from Afghan, if we can. We can't just sit and let other people be responsible for them. We must be responsible for them. The only question is how and when and what we can do, but hopefully we can do something as communities. Chag Sameach, everybody, and thank you. I guess that's true, Rabbi Cameron says was not because it was a different room. Okay.
okay, ladies and gentlemen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make sure that we get through as much of this as we can. First of all, it's, I think I know m virtually everyone who's out there tonight, but for those of you who have not had the chance to meet me in person, my name is Adam Schaefer. I have the privilege and pleasure of being one of the rabbis here at Temple Aliyah and at Shomri Torah Synagogue as of this year, where I've been the director of education on both sides. So it has been a real treat to get to be a part of both communities and to be up here getting to speak to a cross-section of both is a real delight. So for anyone who's wandering in and may not have gotten a copy of the source sheet, if you don't have one from someone sitting next to you, there are a bunch sitting on the front row. And for those of you who are following along online, you can note that if you go to templealiyah.org and or stsonline.org, you should be able to get to the link for or right on the front page of both synagogues websites is the link for this evening and if you click on that link you will see the source sheet available to you to follow along uh, i'm in a fair warning in advance in order for this to work best not only for ourselves but also for the benefit of people online i'm going to need some people to help join me at one of the other mics to help work with some of the readings so that it's not just my voice the entire way so that will be helpful and appreciated when it comes time. If you know that you're someone who can enjoy your voice over the mic, or at least are happy with it, feel free to join us at either side when I call you up. So I wanted to bring this topic tonight because in light of what we are seeing with both President Zelensky and President Putin in the two countries that are dealing with this military conflict, it has been a really interesting time to watch it as Jews because not only do we have all of the obvious identifications with the underdog in the way that the Ukraine has been adequately and accurately portrayed, but we also see so much of our own history and so many challenges that we deal with from both sides. And in some ways, no more was that made more plain than in an article which is on the second page of your, if you flip open, you'll see it, it's double-sided, that came out just a couple of weeks ago in the uh, Jewish News Syndicate, which is admittedly a very conservative uh, particular piece of Jewish news, but they've put an incredible article together here entitled, How Do Putin and Zelensky Get the Holocaust So Wrong? Now, tonight we're not talking just about the way that people in Russia and in Ukraine misinterpret the Holocaust, but it shows you how the challenges that we as Jews face are often on both sides of a military. If you think about it, it's a very common pattern for us as Jews to fall into. That when we're stuck in the middle of a conflict, both sides tend to blame us. If you think about where the Jews were in Germany and in Russia, the, uh, if you look at where things were right before World War II, you had two major parties happening in Nazi Germany. You had the Nazis and you had the communists. The communists blamed the Jews for being far too capitalist, and the Nazis blame the Jews for being too socialist. Now, you could, we all know the challenge is you can't be both the capitalists and the socialists, and yet that's the plot that, excuse me, the, the plight that Jews have found themselves in in so many cases, that when you're in the middle of a conflict, both sides point to you as the blame for where things happen. So if I could, could I ask someone to be the interviewee, if you will, you'd only need to read off of what's here on the page, because I think it will be instructive to help see how the interview played out in real time. Is there someone who'd be willing to be a reader? Come on up, Roma. Thank you. Would you just join us here up front? So 
what I'll do, Rome, is I'm, if you'll bring it and just come to this mic, I believe this one is on. Testing, yes it is. So I'll read the introductory paragraph, and you guys can follow along with me, but I think this is an instructive piece to get us started for the evening. And I'll ask, if you have any questions along the way, please raise your hands immediately, and I'll sort of stop where I am to kind of see where we're going. So it says, it's a piece of the Holocaust that even scholars misunderstand or neglect altogether. And it's a story unknown even to the descendants of a quarter million Holocaust survivors. The United Nations Holocaust Outreach Program hosted author and academic Michal Dekel back on May 11th to discuss her book entitled, In the East, How My Father and a Quarter Million Polish Jews Survived the Holocaust. It was a finalist for the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature, the National Jewish Book Award, and the Chautauqua Prize as well. Dekel's book, part historical, part memoir, presents a unique narrative about Polish refugees fleeing the terror of the Holocaust en route to the Soviet Central Asian Republics and the Middle East. Investigating her late father's mysterious identity as a Tehran child, Dekel dived deep into rare Soviet archives, previously unavailable to Western scholars, charting the path of Holocaust refugees to Siberia, Uzbekistan, and Tehran, where her father and aunt were among those who, say, who survived the war. Why do the Russians insist that they are today denazifying Ukraine? How can Ukraine's president lecture Israel's parliament that his country aided the Jews during the Holocaust? According to Dekel, it revolves around a Soviet perspective of the Holocaust that surprisingly has little or nothing to do with Jews. So JNS, the Jewish News Syndicate, chatted with her to understand what has eluded even dedicated students of the Holocaust. So if you will, we're gonna mimic the interview together and you'll get to hear the different voices and be able to understand how these misunderstandings can become such popular part of both Russian and Ukrainian life. So, how was your webinar with the United Nations? Well, you know, a webinar is very strange because you don't see the audience. You don't know who's there. And the only other person I saw was my interlocutor. So you don't have any energy from the audience. From what I heard, from what people wrote me and also from the United Nations itself. I think it went well. So what kind of questions do you get when discussing your book? Well, first of all, factual questions about the what, when, where, why, and how. There were Holocaust survivors in Tehran, in Kazakhstan. So people are very shocked and confused and uh, it's across the board. It's really extraordinary. Even scholars and people who studied this don't really understand the details. Secondly, these discussions are for people who just don't have any relationship to the story. So for instance, people who are children of survivors, I get many, many emails asking very specific questions saying something like, I knew that my parent was in some gulag, but you know, I don't really understand the story of how did they get to Iran? Questions about research and how to help them uh, find more information. From the United Nations, there comes a lot of the questions, I'm sorry, from the United Nations, a lot of the questions are about the refugee aspect. Although I always like to emphasize that it's a story of refugees within a genocide. So it's not just a story of refugees, but that's an aspect that people always ask me how relevant it is for today's refugee crisis and whether we can learn anything from it and whether I'm willing to talk about the past and the present in the same breath questions about the global history of the Holocaust, which we're not used to thinking about in this way. We're used to this kind of Nazi occupation of Europe, but this is a story that spans completely different territories, and it has to do with the Soviet Empire and with the British Empire. I get these kinds of questions. It does depend on the audience. So what you're seeing, just as we continue a bit, is that most of the time we tend to focus on the Holocaust as this understandable story of what happened in Nazi Germany and Poland and in the camps. And what we don't realize is that while the Soviets were technically speaking on our side in the war, in the sense that they fought as part of the Allies, there were these mass migrations of Jews who left Nazi Germany and ended up going through, to, not to the West, but to the East. And how that plays out in Russian and Ukrainian history is gonna be something that we're gonna see interesting here. 
So it says, I understand that the Holocaust is faded from, many, from memory for many, and that it isn't being taught in schools as much. But how is it that academics, scholars, people educated on the subject aren't even aware of this component of the Holocaust? That's a great question. There are several answers there. Technical answers, political answers. We'll start with the technical because this is a story that took place mostly in the Soviet territories. We don't have access to archives in Russia until the fall of the Soviet Union. And even today, we don't have access to complete archives in the way that we have access through Nazi archives, archives in Germany and in Poland. It's a whole other story. And if you read my book or your readers will read my book, you'll see that some of the research that I did was dangerous. I was in areas that were still very Soviet. They're not Moscow, and they're not St. Petersburg. They're in the Russian interior, and I had plainclothes policemen follow me. I was working with some clandestine human rights activists who were working in Russia, and you have to earn their trust. So it's a little bit like a thriller in that sense. Secondly, the Soviets truly didn't document in the same way that the Nazis did. The Nazis actually documented their atrocities. In my father's hometown in Poland, there was one of the first mass ex executions. There are photographs of people walking to be executed. There are photographs of people kneeling to, uh, at a mass grave that was dug up. And there are photos of the bodies after they've been shot with machine, uh, with machine guns. We don't have any footage of the Gulag. If somebody wants to make a documentary about the Gulag, they have to create footage. There are a handful of photos. Even those are very generic and are not very good. And if you think about how we remember events, it's very visual. We remember the child from the Warsaw Ghetto. Remember? We remember the liberation of Auschwitz. We remember the man falling from the Twin Towers. That's how we remember atrocities. So we don't have the visual imagery. We don't have archives. And still the question remains. Because what we did have were memoirs. And people wrote about their experiences, but few heard those experiences. It wasn't heard, it wasn't heard on a kind of collective level. Like a story is told at the Holocaust Museum in Washington or the institutions that we as Jews have for memory. They didn't really feature the story in a prominent way. It doesn't mean that they don't have testimonies. They are, there are testimonies even in Yad Vashem. But when you go to see the regular exhibition in Washington, you're not going to see that story. I'll pause for a moment just to give some context. Because what you're seeing here ultimately is why what you end up with in Russia and in Ukraine is the ability to meld and twist a story because the evidence that we normally have in so many other spaces. When you think about what happens for Holocaust denial, in most cases we have so much physical evidence of what the Germans did. But what you're seeing in the way that, that this story is told is that unlike what happened in Eastern Europe and the Germany, what here ended up going on in Soviet territories isn't documented the same way. And when you don't have the evidence and the documentation, it allows people to reshape the story to fit a narrative that they want. And we'll see that come back later down the line. If you think about it, I'm telling a story that's very complex. On the one hand, it's a survival story of many people and, of course, the deaths of many people. But the reason these people survived is because they were deported to gulags instead of to death camps. That's the bottom line. The gulags were themselves crimes. The gulags were horrible, inhumane. Still, for many people who were in the gulags, that, faith was still that fate was still better than dying in a gas chamber. So the fact is, that the survivors themselves, I think, had a hard time talking about it in the sense that their entire families were decimated. They survived in this way that was horrible, but they still survived. But to the political aspect, if you think about it, the Soviets were the victors and the savers, sa saviors. To say something negative after the war about the Soviets, the Soviet Union helped Israel in 1948 with military aid, and Israel was a semi-socialist country. So the political conditions were such that there was no place for the story for psychological reasons, for political reasons. There is a seminal memory of the story, that is, Journey into the Land of the Sex and Back, a memoir of the Gulag, by a man called Julius Margolin. He wrote that memoir in Tel Aviv in 1946. 
It was published in Hebrew for the first time around 2013. It was published in English for the first time in 2020. So all these years, it couldn't get published. So now you're starting to see how a new story is beginning to come to light, and we're going to be able to connect it from future, excuse me, from present to the past. So I don't like stretching or trying to make comparisons that don't exist, and so I'll try to avoid it here. But do you feel at all that the current tensions between Israel and Russia will lead to more research and more questioning of the Soviet era during this time? Do you feel that might evolve in some way? I think it will. Somebody asked me that in the UN event, not exactly in these terms, but they asked how this current war affects the way my book is being read. And I said that, first of all, it makes reading my book more possible because people are thinking about Soviet crimes. And in fact, my book is very much related because of a few things. But one of them is this rhetoric that Putin is using when, when he says, I'm fighting Nazis. To us, it's insane, right? Where's he getting this? This is a cynical use of World War II. But in fact, when you travel in the areas that I travel, World, World War II is not even over. They're still talking in these terms. You started by saying Holocaust teachings is on the decline. But you have to understand that in those regions, they don't know anything about the Holocaust. You think here it's on the decline? They think the war between the Nazis or the fascists and the Soviets is that this is Russia versus the world. The Jews have nothing to do with it or very little to do with it. They don't even know about the concentration camps, half of these people. It's shocking. And by the way, I gotta add something here that's not in the script. There are real Nazis in Ukraine that they're fighting. It's an Azov division. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, it's a very- it, So they unfortunately have a, it, a very it's, real- It's a tremendous twisting of the reality yeah, to sort of portray is. a different oh. picture. So what you're starting to see here, and this is a significant piece, is the idea of trying to create a world where it's Russia versus the fascists, whoever they might be. And then if you look at that line that says World War II never really finished, and yet the Jews aren't part of the picture. Now, it's not to say that the things that the Jews didn't exist, it's just an erasure of that particular part to try to create a new reality that makes it about what's going on today. So as the last question, it brings up President Zelensky's interview recently where he described his own family members perishing in the Holocaust, but he never used the word Jew, or even Holocaust for that matter. It really speaks to a perspective of the Holocaust that just isn't known outside that region. I agree with that completely. Zelensky's perspective as someone who grew up in Ukraine is also completely off, because if you recall, he spoke to the Knesset and said Jews should save Ukrainians the way the Ukrainians saved the Jews. And people are saying they're saying, oh my God. But he wasn't being cynical because he grew up on that. It doesn't matter that he's a Jew. He grew up in that education system. They tell a whole other story. They tell the story of Soviet and Nazi aggression against Ukraine. Again, the Jews are not part of this. And in fact, the Ukrainians were the great four victims. And so ethnic Ukrainians, were just as much victims as the Jews. We know that's not true from every piece of evidence we have. There were, of course, exceptions, but I'm speaking generally. That's the story that's being told. God, who can help out with some of the other readings. But you have to look and see where things were to kind of understand where we are today. Because we have to remember how a lot of the Russian and Jewish particular pieces came into being. Some of it intersects in the Holocaust, and some of it predates it. I mean, we all know that Jews were among the original resistors to the Russian Tsarist revolution. And if you look at where many of our ancestors live, many of them were, we often say Russian, because at the time they were all part of the Soviet Union, but many of our ancestors were actually part of Ukraine. And those who lived in the Ukraine often suffered a far worse fate than even the Russians did, because the Ukraine the original Ukrainian region is home to the Cossacks. And if we know anything about what the Cossacks did, they were some of the earliest instigators of the many pogroms that caused many of our ancestors to start to flee the Pale of Settlement before even the Russian Revolution had begun. So many of our ancestors start to leave in the late 1800s, spilling into the 1900s, and by that point, the number of Jews that had been left in Russia just at the turn of the Russian Revolution 
is a lot smaller because of how many come both to Israel in the attempts to be early parts of Zionism, and of course, through Ellis Island and into the United States through a lot of different places. And the ones that are left in Russia end up smack dab in the middle of the Russian Revolution. A lot of them are, as, many, as we all know, they become part of the Bolsheviks. If there were too many, excuse me, too significant moves from a historical perspective that Jewish people did in order to respond to what was going on in Russia, one was Zionism and one was communism or Bolshevism, for lack of a better term. They were both two ways to try to get out from under the thumb of what was going on in Tsarist Russia. It's a gross oversimplification, but it's a good way of, of painting the picture to understand where people came. And then you end up between 1905 and 1918 with the Russian Revolution bubbling over amidst an interesting book. There's a wonderful little book, I say that tongue firmly in cheek, called the Great Within and the Small and Antichrist, an Imminent Political Possibility. Anyone know what the last chapter of that book was called? Pretty close. What was it called? The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. <laughs> okay. That's where the book originally gets, and eventually that chapter gets excerpted out and becomes the manuscript, which we now know has become the, 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 the prototype for so much of the anti-Semitism that Jews around the world, and certainly in the Soviet world, had come in as well. So now you end up with all of the post, excuse me, the post-Russian Revolution issue where the Jews who are there are seen as having done one of two things, again, grossly oversimplifying. Either they were staunchly on one side, or they were often seen as, inno not innocent, but just bystanders. And the danger in being a bystander is that it gives you perfect set up for that piece that we talked about earlier. The idea is if you're the bystander, then whoever was the winner can point to you and say that you were fighting against them, and whoever was the loser can fight with you and say you're the reason why you lost. It's the typical place that Jews end up in. And so the Soviets start a whole campaign to try to eliminate parcel of our prayers. It is part and parcel of our history. It is part and parcel of so many things. So now let's fast forward a couple years. For anyone who feel like they can sort of step into the shoes of Natan Sharansky, you don't need to be male to do it, but is there anyone who feels like they could step into his shoes and be a reader for a little bit? If you're looking at text two here at the bottom. Come on, Ellen, if you'll take it at the mic, please. And as you're listening, what I want you to really do is I want you to listen to two implicit questions that he's trying to answer. They're actually on the front of your piece. One is, think about where Stalin's policies ultimately affected Jews as, with, as they would have when Sharansky was a child, or at least the leftovers of him. What were the concerns of Jews in communist Russia? I was only five when Stalin died, but the memory of that day in 1953 is still clear in my mind. Solemn music filled the streets from the radio loudspeakers, and the people of Stalino, as the Ukrainian city of Donetsk was known in those days, wore black armbands. Yeah, and we now know Donetsk so well because it's such a hotbed of where the conflict is happening. Enormous portraits of Stalin hung everywhere. No laughing or rowdiness today, explained our kindergarten teacher. This is a very sad day. Yosef Vissaronovich Stalin, our leader and teacher, is dead. Mama was crying when I came in, and only later did I learn the real reason for her tears. She was afraid of pogroms. During Stalin's final days, his revived campaign of anti-Semitism, which was especially virulent in the Ukraine, had grown even more heated. Who knew what terrible events might follow in the wake of his death? Earlier that day, Mama had been in the town square where people gathered to listen to the news. As Mama watched in horror, a man walked up to an old Jewish woman and slapped her in the face. Damn kikes, he shouted. You killed our Stalin, and now you're crying? Nobody came to her defense, and my brother and I weren't allowed to leave the apartment for days. <gasps> Papa told me and my brother, Leonid, who was seven, that Stalin had killed many innocent people, that in his final years he had been persecuting Jews, and that we were very fortunate that this terrible butcher was dead. Papa warned us not to repeat these comments to anyone. When I was young, Papa taught me that being Jewish was nothing to be ashamed of, which was an important lesson in a society where well-bred people considered it vulgar to use the word Jew in the presence of a Jew. Like most of my generation, I grew up completely unaware of the religion, language, culture, and history of my people. Words like Torah, Passover, Yom Kippur, and even Shabbat meant nothing to us. 
But Papa was a storyteller, and he sometimes told us tales from the Bible about Joseph and his brothers or Samson and Delilah. Did these stories leave a special imprint on my soul? Did I feel that this was my history, that those were my ancestors who went down to Egypt to escape the famine in their own land and ended up in slavery? If so, those feelings lay dormant for years. Now, in those days, my conscious association with the word Jew was limited to the bureaucratic phrase, fifth line. In the identity papers of my parents and most of our acquaintances, the word Yevre, Jew, was filled in under nationality in the fifth line of the document. Above all, it meant that our opportunities in Soviet society were limited. Officially, of course, there were no barriers for Jews. But I grew up hearing constant references to the fifth line, which explains why X didn't get a certain job, or why wasn't accepted into an outstanding institute despite his qualifications, or why there was no point in applying to this school or that hospital because they already had a Jew there, and the director doesn't want to be accused of turning the place into a synagogue. This phrase, incidentally, was the only context where I ever heard the word synagogue as a child. There were approximately 50,000 Jews in Donetsk, but no synagogues. Nor were there any Jewish schools, not in Donetsk or anywhere else in the country. No Hebrew books were published in the Soviet Union, and there were no opportunities to study Hebrew or Jewish history. So here's the interesting paradox. What do you notice about Sharansky's Jewish identity as he describes it in a child? It's clearly there, but it's an interesting phrasing and an interesting construction. What would you say was his Jewish identity? Yeah, for all intents and that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, and the irony is that there's a national identity in the sense that you're understood to be Yevre as it's put on your, on your national papers. And it also, by the way, meant you weren't Russian. You knew you were different. That's why you weren't allowed to get into things. So you have this identity that, that belongs to you, and yet, what's missing? Yeah, like what, what, you know, can you, the idea of what it actually means to be Yevre. You know, when we think about being a Jew, we have this understanding that it comes with this rich history and culture of being part of a people, being part of a religion, being part of a history, and so on and so forth. And for him, he knows that there's enough of an identity because it's marked in his papers. But that's it. And it goes to an idea that where people were trying, as I said earlier, to take out this understanding of what it meant to be anything other than one of these other nations, to try to sublimate it to being Russian in some way, shape, or form, and yet never to expunge it completely. It's this interesting mix where you can't be who you are, but you also can't really become the thing that everyone else is. And part of that, where we start to see, becomes the issue of Israel, and Israel in particular. Because the idea, here's the irony, Israel probably set itself up, as we all know with the kibbutz movement, as one of the best examples of a communist and socialist society in many ways far better than Russia ever actually did, or any of the Soviet socialist republics. They became almost what Russia and had wished it could be, this idea where people truly shared in all the production and were equally benefiting, <coughs> excuse me, equally benefiting across all the different populations. Now, let's not over romanticize the kibbutz movement either, it had its own issues, but they were much more successful. And there was also, with the, with the advent of Israel, a place for Jews to look outside, a place for them to think that they could belong. And if you think about it, it's very eerily, uh, excuse me, very eerily echoing the same charges of dual loyalty that we end up hearing as Americans all the time. So here's where it gets really fascinating. I want you to take a look at this particular, this one I'll read. Text, the third text here is the entry in a Russian great Soviet encyclopedia about Zionism. Now, don't think it'll come as any surprise to you that when we read this, it's not gonna really re resemble much of the Zionism that you or I ever knew. But try to see what it was that they tried to cast Zionism as. How could they, here's what I'm gonna ask you to try to do. What, uh, the question I'm gonna ask you now, and I'll ask you as soon as we're done reading it is, tell me what the elevator pitch is of this particular encyclopedia article. If you had to boil it down when we're done reading it, let's take a look at where it says. Zionism, 
from the name Zion Hill in Jerusalem is the most reactionary type of Jewish bourgeois nationalism, which gained a significant following in the 20th century among the Jewish population of capitalist countries. Contemporary Zionism is a nationalist ideology, an extensive and complex system of organizations, and a policy expressing the interest in the top tier Jewish bourgeoisie, which is closely connected to the monopolistic bourgeoisie of imperialist states. The main content of contemporary Zionism is militant chauvinism, racism, anti-communism, and anti-Sovietism. Probably a pretty good elevator pitch right there, but we'll get to more. The ideologues of Zionism try to prove an inseparable connection of all Jews all over the world to Zionism, to which they subordinate, should subordinate their interests wherever they are. The politicized dogmas of Judaism about the Jewish people being, quote, chosen by God, unquote, and messianic, as well as the mythical thesis of their, quote, exceptionality, unquote, comprise one of the foundations of extreme nationalism, chauvinism, and racism imminent to this ideology. The ideologues claim that the Jewish question is eternal, special, and transcends social class. The Zionists propagate the mendacious idea of class peace between the Jewish working class and the Jewish bourgeoisie, the idea that all Jews are brothers. All forms of class struggle among Jews are denounced by the ideologues of Zionism as treason against the Jewish nation. By means of demagoguery and tactical maneuvers, the Zionists have always tried and still try to conceal the anti-people reactionary nature of Zionism, attempting to pass it for a, quote, national liberation movement of the Jewish people all over the world. We could look on, go on and read a lot more of it, but let's take a look at just those two paragraphs. What do you already see is the, how they are trying to cast Zionism? I'm sorry? Okay, part of it is it very much so fits the idea of it being a cabal in the sense that we often hear about in things like the protocols. It is this nefarious, uh, nefarious underhanded movement almost trying to constant subterfuge and undermining the rest of society. What else do you hear in the way they describe this piece? Rama. Right, and, and elitist almost does, uh, is, is almost too kind in certain ways. I mean, the fact that they use the word chauvinist, it's the idea of elitism, but in the worst way. You know, if you think about the phrase when we have, you know, when we think about male chauvinist pig, it's the idea that, that, the idea that how dare you try to say that men are inherently better than women are. So to be chauvinist is the idea to suggest that, that Jews are trying to say that Zionism is their way of saying that we Jews are better than everybody else. Now, not only is this somewhat anathema in general, if any group were to try to say, oh, our group is better than everybody else, it would feel like they were against even an American ethos, but it's even more against the Soviet ethos. Because the Soviet ethos, a at least in a capitalist society, for better or for worse, you can always say that a group can be, through whatever merit, can reach a top and climb a ladder. In a communist world, there is no ladder, or at least there's not supposed to be. The idea is that you're supposed to all be equal. So if you have an entire group existing within you whose sole goal is to declare themselves to be better than everyone else, you can understand why the idea of Zionism became a, a dirty word in and of itself within Soviet society. Now, in the interest of time, because we have only a little bit more to go through, here's the, 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 the piece that we'd forget. This uh, piece comes out in 1972, and I believe it's only a few years later that the United Nations passes a rather infamous resolution. And I think we all know the three words of that resolution. Zionism is a form of racism. Zionism is a form of racism. Okay. People often think that that was something that came out of the Arab world. It's not. The Arabs seized upon it and used it to their advantage but it's lifted almost square straight out of what you see here from Russia. This was where that whole idea came from. This was where the idea of trying to suggest that, that Jews were, if you will, if you think about the kind of language that people hear in anti-Zionist circles today, the idea that Jews were merely trying to take over a land that didn't really belong to their own, that the entire Jewish story is mythological and not real that there are so many other pieces that end up resurfacing and rebubbling and pop back. A lot of them are rooted 
in these same ideas that we saw in that first story about where you take the Jews out of the picture, you paint them in your own particular light, you recast their story, and you can completely change the narrative of what was so that it's understood in a totally different and not so flattering light. So as a result, if you flip your page over, take a look at the two political cartoons that are here. Now, I can, I'll give you at least a little piece that the writing in the top cartoon, I, I can't read Russian, but I at least have the decoder, the, the Rashi script decoder ring from the Cracker Jack box you know, that says here that, that those letters that are under the tr root of the tree say Israel. Okay. So if you know that that piece reads Israel, what do you see in that top political cartoon? Okay, yeah, part of it is that the, the, exactly, the roots of Israel lay in, in Nazism at some level. Here's where you get the connections of denazifying lands that are still there. The idea, that it, it, it's the ultimate twist to actually suggest that Israel is, is rooted in Nazism. And it's a charge that you now continue to see leveled in the anti-Zionist circles that Jews are doing to the Palestinians what the Nazis did to the Jews. The Jews have become the Nazis. This is where this stuff takes, literally has its roots. What else do you see in that particular top, uh, top political cartoon? Oh, it's anything but a tree of life. I mean, it, it, what's the description of that tree? If you had to, yeah, it's literally dripping with blood off an axe or axes as the case may be. Well, to be fair, I'm not, I, I, not having the full context of what it would have been like in Russia in 1982, I'm not sure which. I, and my guess, with my limited knowledge, is that we were really looking more at how it was decimating Soviet society. I don't think that, that, that the, with a limited amount of news that was coming in and out of Russia, I doubt that most Russians would have had any understanding of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as it was in 1982. So my guess is that the idea here is simply saying that Jews are undermining through their Zionist policies, all of the Soviet goals. And you can really start to see that when you look at something that was actually 10 years earlier. Look at the bottom political cartoon. Here's the ultimate twisting of things. What's the main feature of this piece? Yeah, the idea that the swastika and the Mogan David, the, the Star of David could actually be intertwined. But this was Soviet newspapers. This was Soviet, you know, this was, as I put it here on the original, this was the original fake news. Maybe not the original, but so before there was fake news here that we talked about, this was the way that the Russians would try to do things. The, ch the challenge for us to realize is that their fake news became such a dominant narrative that it really became part and parcel of world conversation. It's not an accident that the United Nations, four years after this cartoon, makes the, re makes the reference that they do and creates the resolution that they do. So it gives us a very different taste and a different feel for where things are at. You start to see a lot of the pieces emerging from both Ukrainian and uh, Soviet pieces as to where that kind of language, that kind of story, and that kind of twisting of what we know to be the facts starts to come from. So, to kind of close things out, I want us to take a look at a story that was written in 2012, but it was from a long time ago. This is from a uh, uh, man with the last name of Mendelevich. He's an interesting character because he was involved in a, uh, in a hijacking effort that uh, happened in the early 70s, and not surprisingly, the Soviets tried to capture him and take care of, uh, and try to, if you will, squash his story. He did, like Sharansky, manage to make his way to Israel where he was ultimately able to tell his story. Is there one last reader who'd be able to come and take this one from the mic? It's a short one. Kelly, come on up. And thank you. So just by back, as Kelly makes her way, 
I'll, I'll, I'll put it up this way, that ultimately, Mendelevich was born in Riga, same place that Daniel was from earlier in 1947. He ultimately was a refusenik like Sharansky. He had tried to get out any number of times. He was ultimately arrested for treason, and he was sentenced to 15 years incarceration. So the text here speaks of his arrest, and of him and some of the other members of group arrested in the Dimitschutz Kuznetsov aircraft hijacking affair that was organized by a man named Edward Kuznetsov. Under the pretense of a wedding, uh, Kuznetsov, you take the other mic if it's okay? I don't mind, but you're prepared to go. Uh, yes, I have this one, I have one here, if that'll work. No problem. Under the pretense of a wedding, Kuznetsov brought 16 seats on a small plane that was flying between Leningrad and Prizersk, and the pilots were tossed, supposed to be tossed from the plane, and it was supposed to be flown to Sweden as a way of getting Jews out. Uh, as they made to the tarmac, unfortunately, they were arrested by the KGB, and each member was given an arrest warrant that they were forced to sign that provided all the details of the intent to hijack the plane and flee the Soviet Union which left Jews in the position of being able to say, of having to say that they were trying to betray the motherland in order to flee to the, and I quote, imperialist state of Israel. Same kind of language that you saw in the encyclopedia article. So if you look at this back page, it's the very back side of the, of the piece, text number six from uh, Yosef Mendelevich. <coughs> Kelly, could you be so kind? Yes. All is lost. They're already taking us to be interrogated on the spot. On the way, these idiots take my backpack with the weapons inside. Fine, let them search me. They bring me to a small room packed with high-ranking officers and special investigators, one of whom prefers an arrest warrant. Read it and sign. I read it with disbelief. They know everything. District prosecutor's office, according to, the, uh, according to the report of the operations department of the security services. A cell of Jewish terrorists has been active in the area of the airfield with the intent of betraying the motherland and fleeing to the imperialist state of Israel, thus violating Article 15-64 of the Criminal Code. I hereby order the arrest and interrogation of the criminal gang and warn that if the charges prove true, its members will face the death penalty. The death penalty? For me? How will I be able to stand this? The KGB interrogations, the trial, the death sentence, these require heroic fortitude like Judah Maccabee or Joseph Trumpeldor, the hero of Tel Hai, whose famous last words were, never mind, it is good to die for our country. Or Mordechai Anilovitz, leader of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. But I'm no hero, just a miserable Jewish student in the car, disguised as a civilian vehicle. I glance outside at the free world. Perhaps, excuse me, perhaps for the last time. Though it is Russia, the very country I've been trying to flee here too. Under the blue morning skies, people are going to work, mothers are pushing carriages. Life, my life, I think, might be coming to an end. I ask myself a piercing question. Nu, what do you have to say for yourself? Do you regret your decisions? There are moments in a man's life when he cannot deceive himself, when there is no one to deceive. I think to myself, no, I regret nothing. So deep is my love for my people and my homeland that had I passed up this chance to escape this foreign land, I would have despised myself for the rest of my days. For something of the highest importance, you must be prepared to pay the highest price. I was willing to sacrifice even my, life of, my love of life and now I feel content. 
So here's what you start to see. First of all, for those of us who grew up and watched the Soviet Jewish crisis, this is very much so reminiscent of the kinds of things that we would hear all the time. These were the kinds of stories that we would hear about people who had been denied exit visas, who were trying to get out of the country to go anywhere, ideally to the United States, ideally to Israel, but anywhere but to be where they were. And when you look at that movement, which culminated, of course, in the late 80s and ultimately with the downfall of the Soviet Union and led to the kind of, of refugees who were able to finally get out, like Daniel and Alina, what you hear finally is the beginning of the breaking between the idea of people being Jews and being Zionists. What you hear here in Mendelevich's piece is the notion that he finally had to be able to say, yes, I am both a Jew and a Zionist. This is not a Sharansky story. Sharansky starts talking about how he had no idea who he really was other than what was listed on his passport. Mendelevich has gotten to the point where after 40 years where they've tried to suppress this sort of thing, they ultimately had to open up. Too many things got through, too many things changed, and too much of a reaction to the idea of Zionism being racism had finally gone to the point where we could change and turn the story around. What we see today, unfortunately, though, is that what's buried in the past doesn't stay there. These very stories that came out and fed the initial story about Zionism being racism or being an illegitimate movement have now come out all over again. So when we hear about what's going to happen later, as when Rabbi Galko in the league finishes tonight and talks about Rabbi's, excuse me, President Zelensky's great leadership, I want us to think about what it must mean for him to be a Jew under these circumstances. What does he really see? What does he really know? How much does his particular point of view fall into the reality? And how much of it is still informed by the misinformation he had to be suffered for his views? Keep your eyes on the news. Keep your ears peeled. You'll hear a lot. Chag Sameach, everyone, and thank you very much. All right, go have some cheesecake. And we'll be back here at 11.15 for uh, talking about Zelensky's leadership. For those of you joining us by live stream, go take a little break, have some blintzes, some cheesecake, but don't turn off the live stream. We'll be back here 11.15 to talk about Zelensky's leadership. Some of these texts are, are lifted straight out of the Melchizedek curriculum. But I've also the kind of person who has been following a lot of it in the anti so as, as being anti Zionist has become raising its profile in the past few yeah. years. You sort of start to see where is it coming from? That's been underground for so long. And they also conflated it just with Nazism and fascism in general. Like they almost, they, we, pe they, for them, for the Russians, it seems that the way I understand it is that they obviously were fighting the Germans. That was a huge piece for them. We know that the Polish border, you know, they split Poland up and had to deal with it accordingly. So for them, they almost miss the Jews. They're, they're both ever, they are both either completely present and simultaneously completely absent from the story. And it's, you know, it, you, you get to turn the coin to whichever side is more convenient for your piece. Right. And I think that's what people think of Zelensky. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when he says he's denazifying, he's not thinking of it necessarily as an anti-Semitic thing. He really believes at some level he's taking out the same Nazi presence that was there however long ago. Right. Thank you. You're welcome, Ellen. Ellen, thank you for the reading, by the way. It was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Price of admission, Rabbi. <laughs> Much appreciated. All room was December 6th. Exactly one year later, on December 6, 87, was the massive march on Washington for Soviet Jews. Right, right, right. 
and I, you know, I'm from DC, yeah. so it was in my backyard, yeah. and it was amazing to see. You know, there are obviously people busing from all over the area just for the locals, right. but the fact that people were coming in from literally all over the country, all over the world, to set up on that kind of stuff. Yeah. And at the time, like you know, all we thought about it was about just the idea of, of Soviet suppression of Jewish religion, and obviously that still was a huge piece of it. But as I get older, we start to learn so much more, and part of it is that a lot got cracked open when the, when the when the Iron Curtain fell. You know, we came to finally understand, and that's what I love about that first article. That first article is, is sort of saying that there's a, so much about Soviet understanding of World War II that historians just haven't had access to. They're, they're just cracking into it now, 50 or 75 years after the fact. Big mistake when the U.S. was willing to uh, subvert. You know, it, we can argue you know, hindsight 2020. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it yeah, sure yeah. looked good at the time. Yeah. <laughs> it looked like it was getting a pretty good win, oh, yeah. but I can totally understand. So Bob, it's a pleasure. Say hi to all three of your grandchildren I for me. I, actually, all four, all but four. The, certainly the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. You checking for tomorrow? Yep. I got to move the Torah. I forgot to do it. Do you need a hand? Uh, if you want to put the Vogel in that center right area, it's over there. Okay. And then I'm. The right the yes, because I'm because I'm moving this one because this is the one we're reading. This is the first Torah, so I want to make sure. And I guess you need one. To yeah, that's the one on the, the the bottom right. Oh, wait a minute. We're, we're going to do a good job. Let's take the big ones off. We're going to take one, too. Big ones go back in. Got it. Ooh. I like my hair. My pleasure. Let me get my stuff out of the way.
All right, so I know people are still filtering in, um, but we'll get started and then people can join our conversation as they, as they make their way in. Um, for those of you joining by live stream, by the way, the source sheet that we're going to be using is available on our website, so you should be able to see that uh, just like you could see Rabbi Adams from earlier. So for those of you who are here in person, what are the leadership qualities that have made Zelensky such a great leader during this time of crisis? I think we can all agree, and as Jews, I think we've been so proud of him. Um, what is it specifically that has made him such a great leader? Nice. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat, he's a comedian, so he's very media savvy, right? He's amazing at using social media. He does, he makes these self-shot videos, right? It feels personal, like he's talking directly to you. He's looking right into the camera. It's very relatable, uh, very personal, yeah. Absolutely, he could have left, he stayed. Right? He is leading by example. He's showing his bravery. Um, and, you know, I think we, we can all look at Putin as an example of someone who leads from the top, maybe. And Zelensky is a leader who leads from the front. Like, not, not from an ivory tower somewhere, but from the front lines himself. Yeah, right. Zelensky is unafraid. He's bold, and yeah, and he's 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 willing to have people. He's communal in a way that's so unlike Putin, having right, a whole table's worth of distance between himself and other people. Um, I think I saw another hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is amazing that he's really not hiding. I mean, it's just bravery against all odds. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts, reasons why you think Zelensky's leadership has just been so remarkable? Yeah, they, right, we had, right, we had seen this example of other leaders leaving during times of crisis, and so there was almost an assumption that he would do that too, and yet he didn't. Yeah. Great. Okay, so he, he's trying to build consensus. I think we could say maybe there's sort of like a values-based leadership. Um, it feels like he actually cares about the people um, and actually cares about the future of Ukraine. He's, he humanizes the cause. Yeah. Was there anyone else who I missed? So one other thing that I want to point out is I think that he has done a really great job of striking a balance between conveying to the world what a crisis is going on, and yet maintaining a sense of hope and confidence at home. It's a really challenging balance, right, to, to not, not have people at home panic and yet not have the world think, oh, this isn't so bad, to be able to, to strike that balance. Um, and he's done that through, like a lot of you said, these really bold statements, right? I don't need a, I, I need ammunition, not a ride. These bold statements that have stuck with us um, and his way of being direct and personal, self-shot videos speaking straight to the camera, um, the values-based leadership. Um, I think he also portrays some humility as well. He's clearly confident, 
But there's some humility. He, he knows he can't win without the help of the rest of the world. Like, he is very well aware of that. He is not under any false pretenses, thinking that he alone, one man and one army and one small country compared to Russia, is going to win. He knows he needs help, and I think that, that brings some humility um, to him as well. So I want to explore Zelensky's leadership style and compare it to that of another Jew, our greatest biblical leader, Moses. So I want us to read some passages um, and see what we can glean, even, even maybe without self-shot videos of Moses speaking directly to the camera. We'll see what we can learn anyway um, from these texts. So because we're live streaming here and your voices won't be picked up um, by the microphone, I'm going to read um, and then we will uh, we'll discuss them. So this first text, Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, pick some troops for us and go out and do battle with Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Then whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But whenever he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur, one on each side, supported his hands. Thus his hands remained steady until the sun set, and Joshua overwhelmed the people of Amalek with the sword. So what we have going on here is a, a wartime situation, a battle, Amalek threatening to destroy the Israelite people, much like Putin threatening to destroy Ukraine. So how does Moses handle it? Looking at this text here, what does Moses do? How does he handle it? But he recognizes that he needs help, and he allows for that help from the outside. What else do you notice about what Moses does here? Right. Now, on the one hand, he actually doesn't go to the front lines of battle. Right? He sends Joshua to do that. And so you could look at this text and criticize Moses as a leader and say, you know what? This is leading from the top. This is Putin leading from afar, leading from the far side of a long table, not from the front lines of battle. But the reality is what you're saying here, he knows his own strengths. Like, he knows that where he's going to be the most useful is at the top of the hill, lifting up his hand. Um, and he doesn't excuse himself, Ben. He, he knows, he's not saying, I'm too old, I can't handle this. He puts himself right into it um, in the way that he can do best. And he accepts help um, when, he, when he isn't able to continue on his own. Anything else that you noticed here? He's an inspirational leader. He's in trying to inspire those who are doing the actual fighting. Absolutely. So let's compare that to Zelensky. Right? We have a couple of quotes here. This first one um, on the sheet is, is perhaps his most famous that we've already quoted here this evening. The fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. Right? We know that this was Zelensky's response when the U.S. offered to help him get out safely. And like you all said at the beginning of this session, we all assumed, of course, he would take the U.S. up on that. We saw Afghanistan's leader leave. We know that that's often what leaders do. They know they're the number one target, and so they leave, and yet he didn't. And that made such a big impact on the world. That meme, that, that picture with that quote, that circulating around on social media, the fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. The next quote, when you attack us, you will see our faces, not our backs, but our faces. Right? He always says our. 
He's really good about that. Our backs, our faces. He's always including himself in the statement, always in the first person and always communal. It's also a way of showing bravery and a way of humanizing their cause. Faces, not backs. So turn the page. Let's look at another text about Moses in a different situation, um, one that many of us might be familiar with. As soon as Moses came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, right, this is the golden calf situation here, he became enraged, and he hurled the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it. He ground it to powder and strewed it upon the water and so made the Israelites drink it. So w- Moses, this is a very angry reaction we have from Moses. What do you think about Moses' angry reaction in this situation? Do you think, that, do you think there's a place for this, a- Moses' angry reaction? Do you think it's warranted? Do you think he should have showed more restraint? I see a head shaking. No, no, you don't think he should have shown more restraint? Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, in a way we can take pity on Moses. Like, We all might be a little irritable in that kind of situation, too. You climbed a mountain. You've been by yourself. You've had this very scary, intimidating experience of an interaction with God, of, you know, the the closest to a face-to-face interaction with God that any human being can, can achieve. And he's come down the mountain all doing all this, serving these people, all for this cause, and then he comes down the mountain, and this is what he sees. Like, yeah, I, I think we might all have this kind of angry response. But what I'm curious about from you is, do you think this was the right response? Like, we can acknowledge that Moses was a human being, and human beings have emotions and make mistakes. But do you think this was the right strategic response for Moses, this anger? Yeah. That's okay. Great. Okay, so I want to pick up on two things you said. The first is um, that we can sort of understand where the Israelites are coming from. We said we could take pity on Moses, but we can also take pity on the Israelites to some extent. They have followed Moses out of Egypt. He is their leader. He is the one who brings them comfort, the one who connects them to God, really. Like, they have seen all of these miracles happen because of, they think at least, maybe, because of Moses, because of their connection with Moses. And so they've been waiting for a long time and he hasn't come back and who knows maybe he abandoned them he deserted them we don't know and so they've turned to a new leader and so yeah I I think you're right that we can have some take some pity on the the Israelite people as well Um, the second thing you said is about Moses disappearing that actually this in this text we can contrast Zelensky's leadership and Moses leadership because Moses did disappear now I don't think anyone's blaming Moses for the disappearance of going up to receive the Ten Commandments from God. I I think we're okay with that disappearance. But to the people on the ground, it felt like a disappearance. And yeah, Zelensky did not make his people in Ukraine feel that sense of 
where's our leader? Our leader who we trust is gone. Um, absolutely. And just to be clear, um, I think that the, there are lessons to be learned about Moses' leadership and about Zelensky's leadership, and sometimes it's because they have traits in common, and sometimes it's because they have traits that are not in common. So you're not, you're not um, heckling me here. I appreciate your bringing up ways in which, uh, in which their, their leadership traits actually differ. Um, do you think there's a place for showing anger as a leader? Strategically. Now, I, you all are very nice people and are making sure we say, okay, Moses, he was going through a tough time, the Israelites going through a tough time, but purely from a strategic perspective, do you think that there's ever a strategic reason for showing anger as a leader, or no? Is it, is it always better to just maintain your sense of calm? Elisa? That's great. That's a really important distinction. I'm going to repeat that for the live stream. So Aliza says there's a difference between showing anger at a situation or at an enemy versus showing anger at the people that you are leading. That, that that's, that's a really important distinction. Ben? super important. It's like a boy who cried wolf thing a little bit. It's, ben says it's about how often you show anger. If every day you're screaming at this person and screaming at that person, no one's going to take your anger seriously. People are just think you're kind of always like bubbling up to the top and you never know when, when your anger is going to come out. But if once in a while you show your anger, it really can have some power. Rabbi Adam? Okay, so the, the difference between righteous indignation, where it's really about the cause, and zealotry, when you're sort of blinded um, and, and you, you can't even stay focused on the cause anymore. Yeah. Um, Ofer, were you going to say something? I love that. I love that psychological take that, right, when, when we look at the Torah overall, there are so many um, situations we read about where God is angry and Moses is the one calming God down. And maybe this is Moses, like, playing little mind games and saying, like, if, okay, if I show anger here, God's going to feel like we've checked the anger box and, and not need to get angry, too. Um, I, I never thought of it that way, and I love it. I think it's brilliant. Um, any other thoughts about this? Any other um, reactions to a, a leader showing anger? Now, when we think about Zelensky, I think uh, we often think about him as pretty calm, cool, collected, right? When he does his self-shot videos, he's usually sort of like 
He, he is emotional in tone in a good way that allows us to, to feel like we can relate to him on a personal level, but he always seems like he's in control. Um, but I, I, I want us to read this next quote here because I think he is able to show anger in measured, particular ways. And like Ben Aminia said, when it's not every day and it's in specific circumstances, and like Aliza said, when it is at a situation or at an enemy, not at the people you're leading, there can actually be some real value to it. So Zelensky says, we will not forgive, we will not forget. We will punish everyone who committed atrocities in this war. We will find every scum who was shelling our cities our people, who was shooting the missiles, who was giving orders, you will not have a quiet place on this earth except for a grave. Th that's an angry statement, um, and in a good way, I think. It comes across as brave, unafraid, bold. Um, we were speaking at the beginning of this session about wh what Zelensky's qualities are that have made him such a good leader. I think some of those come across even in the anger of that statement. That, that courage and just sense of fearlessness. Um, and speaking of his fearlessness, as many of you pointed out, his next quote here, I'm not hiding, and I'm not afraid of anyone. He wants to make sure everyone knows that he is in it just as much as any other Ukrainian. There's no hiding. Um, it's a very brave and bold statement from someone who knows that he's Russia's number one enemy and target. Um, and, and I think it's, it's particularly brave and bold in the context of what, what all of you said earlier, that so many leaders in his situation have left to protect themselves, and he didn't. Um, and so I want to read one more quote here before we read another passage about Moses. We Ukrainians are a peaceful nation, but if we remain silent today, we will be gone tomorrow. I think we can actually sort of hear reflections of Golda Meir's famous statement about Israel in this. Um, right, if the Palestinians lay down their weapons, there will be peace. If the Israelis lay down their weapons, there will be a massacre. Like, there's Zelensky's statement, we want to be peaceful. We Ukrainians, we're a peaceful nation. We want to be peaceful. But if we remain silent, we will be gone. Like, if we lay down our weapons, we will be gone. And I think it's a way of striking that balance that we spoke about earlier this evening, right? conveying the severity of the crisis to the world, making sure the world knows if we stop fighting, we will be gone. It is that severe of a crisis. And yet at the same time, maintaining confidence and hope at home by saying we are a peaceful nation. We will one day get back to being a peaceful nation. Um, but first, we have to fight this fight. So let's turn the page again. Oh, no, sorry, not turn the page. I'm sorry. At the bottom of this page. Uh, we're going to read one more situation that Moses finds himself in. Um, this one, some of you may know about. This is about the daughters of Tzalofchad, who are, um, who are looking for rights to inherit property. The daughters of Tzalofchad, of Manasite family, son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Mahir, son of Manasseh, son of Joseph, come forward. The names of the daughters were Machla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirsah. They stood before Moses, Eliezer the priest, and the chieftains, and the whole assembly at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And they said, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not one of the faction, Korach's faction, which banded together against God, but died, but died for his own sin, and he has left no sons. So just pause there for a minute so you understand. What they're saying is our father was a good guy. He wasn't part of the Korach rebellion, the people who tried to um, take Moses out of his position of leadership, the people who went against God's wishes. He died on his own. It had nothing to do with, with the, the bad things that, that have happened. I'll keep going. Let not our father's name be lost to his clan just because he had no son. Give us a holding among our father's kin kinsmen. Give us the land. Give us his property. We want to inherit it. And he had no sons, but let us, his daughters, inherit it. Moses brought their case before God. So this is the story of Benot Tzlovchad, the daughters of Tzlovchad, 
Um, there's, I think there's a lot that's fascinating about this story, actually. But for our purposes this evening, for the purpose of understanding Moses' leadership qualities, to me, the important part of this is the last sentence. Moses brought their case before God. People bring a case to Moses, and he's aware of what he doesn't know. He realizes that he actually doesn't know the answer. And instead of just making something up and kind of wanting to seem like he knows everything, which I think so many leaders would do, right? You're brought a question and you want to seem like you're in charge. You know everything. Um, instead of trying to seem like he has all the knowledge, all the wisdom, he admits what he doesn't know. And he brings the case to God. I think this is a real moment of humility and vulnerability for Moses. And then now you can... Uh, Turn to the last page there. We have this beautiful statement, I think, about Moses' character. Now, Moses himself was very humble, more so than any other human being on earth. I think like Moses, Zelensky has, has really, he's quickly become an important figure in history. And yet when he's presented with that, here's what he says. I'm not iconic. Ukraine is iconic. Like he, he deflects that sense of like, you are it. You are our leader, capital L leader. He's a leader, and yet he has a real sense of humility, which I think is part of what helps people feel connected to him. Um, so I, I want to pause here and ask you if you think, and there's really no right answer here. You, you can say yes or no or something else. Do you think humility is a good quality for a leader to have? Do you think you can have too much humility and it could be not a good thing for a leader or not enough humility? What do you think? Absolutely. Okay, so we have one opinion that humility is essential because otherwise you don't listen to other people's opinions. Otherwise you are not able to take in the advice of other people who might actually know better than you in certain situations. Even if you have an amazing knowledge of history and world affairs and the personalities of the other leaders you're dealing with, there's always someone who has some piece of information that you don't have. Always. Um, and if you're not able to take in information from different people and accept that sometimes you don't know everything, that sometimes even Moses, who can, you know, listen to every possible case and know the answer and what to do and what's the Jewish legal response, even Moses can be faced with Benot Tzlovchad, the daughters of Tzlovchad, who present him with a case where he doesn't know the answer. Um, and it takes some humility. You have to be able to take in information from other people. David? Right, you can't, on the other side there, you can't have so much humility that you actually always assume everybody knows more than you. You have to have some confidence that you have judgment, that you're a leader for a reason. You have judgment, and you take in what different people tell you, facts from different perspectives, and then ultimately you make a decision. 
Um, and yeah, it's actually too much humility for a leader. If every time you receive information from the outside, you automatically assume, oh, they know more than I do. Yeah, good. Anyone else? Yeah. Don't apologize. That's great. Yeah, that part of humility, it's not just about how you make the decisions. It's then after the fact, um, being able to give credit to other people, giving credit where credit is due, um, and even also being able to take some of the blame when that's necessary as well. I think that requires a certain level of humility. Um, you know, I think we th there are always leaders who are willing to take all the credit when something goes well and none of the blame when something goes poorly. And then there are also leaders who are willing to take blame when something goes poorly and willing to share the credit when something goes well. Um, and, and there's a lot of humility involved in that. Yeah. Anyone else? Other comments? Yeah, and so I think we're, we're in agreement here that humility is important to a point. You can't have too much of it. Um, just like any other quality, really, there's... There, there are lots of good qualities that one might want to have, and then sometimes having too much of them is actually um, a negative. Um, I, I think the biggest similarity, and we've, we've read through lots of different you know, quotes of Zelensky and situations about Moses, um, but to me what stands out as the single biggest commonality between Moses and Zelensky is their ability to not make everything about themselves. To make something about a cause and a people, and that they're one of those people, but that it's not just about themselves. Um, and I think they both genuinely see themselves as servants to the people. Um, with the way we hear Zelensky talking, just the mere fact that he has stayed in Ukraine throughout this time and not left, um, he views himself as a servant to the Ukrainian people. And certainly Moses as well viewed himself as a servant to God and a servant to the Israelite people. Um, I think that it can be really hard in a leadership position to maintain that level-headedness, that lack of ego, to be able to view yourself in that way. Um, but I, I do think that Moses and Zelensky both are, are, have, that's a real um, strength of both of theirs. So I, I want to close, and then we can uh, discuss any, any more qualities you've noticed that, that we haven't already spoken of. But I want to close by reading two of what I think are Zelensky's most inspirational, hopeful, confident quotes. Because I do think his ability to, to, to show that hope and confidence is, is so significant as well. So he says, no panic. We're strong. We're ready for anything. Um, and he said, nobody is going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Um, any thoughts about these quotes? Any of the Zelensky quotes we've looked at tonight or others that you've heard him say um, in, in his uh, self-shot videos or, or otherwise? Um, any, any other qualities of him that we haven't really gotten to lift up this evening yet that you wanted to share?
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just so you know, th this quote was meant to be connected to the golden calf story. It's, it's, un it's underneath that story to, yeah, to illustrate that, that sense of anger in, in a good way. That when you show that anger, and he's showing that anger to the Russians, letting them know, yeah, what they are doing is wrong, and they will be held responsible for it. And I think you're right that we, as Jews, seeing this statement, I think we immediately, at least I immediately, think of the Holocaust um, and how in the years following the Holocaust, um, we've tried to bring those responsible to justice. Um, and that this is his intention, that he, he wants the Russians to know that they are not going to get away with this. What they are doing is wrong, and they will be punished for it. Yeah. Great. So... My hope is that we can sort of get two things out of learning about Zelensky's leadership. First, I think that many of us in this room have opportunities to be leaders in our lives regularly. Um, and I think we can learn skills and traits that we can try to emulate when we find ourselves in those leadership positions. But second, and really crucially importantly, um, we spent some time thinking about how Zelensky how hard Zelensky and the Ukrainians are working to defend their democracy. And my hope is that that inspires us to do something to help. So I hope you heard something tonight that sparked something in you. Maybe it was from Joe Goldman from Hyas speaking at the beginning of our evening. Uh, maybe it was from Hazan Mimi in her healing service. Maybe it was from one of our rabbis um, in a Torah study session. But I really hope that as soon as the holiday ends, you will figure out a way that you can be involved in this important effort. Um, and you heard Rabbi Kamra speaking earlier about how badly he wants our two communities to join together to be able to form a welcome circle through Hyas um, and to really do what we can. We heard from Alina and Daniel earlier about their own personal experience of having left the Soviet Union um, and coming here and what it's like to be a refugee, what it's like to, what it's like to be an immigrant in their case, um, and, and what a real challenge it is to integrate yourself into American society and how we all can be of help to people who need it. You know, we, we started this evening by saying we were slaves in the land of Egypt, so we know what it's like to need help. And now on Shavuot, we receive our covenant with God, a covenant that's based, it's all based on the fact that God helped us get out of Egypt, and now we must do the same for any of God's creations who are suffering as well. Chag Sameach. Thanks for participating.